very happy to host this important occasion of study and discussion dedicated to the Architectural Museum. And we're grateful to the leading scholars, curators, and designers who've accepted our invitation to con contribute. Architectural museums can play an important part in presenting aspects of architecture and the architect's activity, both in the present and the past. Architectural museums and exhibitions, of course, suffer from a obvious disadvantage. When compared with museums and exhibitions of sculpture, painting, and other transportable works of art, one cannot normally move whole buildings to an exhibition space. Sometimes an architectural museum building, however, can itself be an exhibit, usually containing movable exhibits. This is the case here at Palazzo Barbaran, as a well-preserved palace designed by Palladio, or at the Sohn Museum, an architectural masterpiece which even preserves its original interior decoration and contents. The architectural museum, however, like architectural exhibitions, suffers from the fact that it can usually present only models or other representations of buildings and not the buildings themselves with their interior spa spaces and their exterior impact. This means that it has to display representations, films, virtual or actual models, plans and drawings, and sometimes components like capitals or decorative structural details like bricks or tiles. The Architectural Museum, or at least its ancestors, is not a recent invention. For Renaissance architects, Rome or Verona or Nîmes constituted a sort of museum to be visited, studied, drawn, and even published. The term virtual museum was not used in the Renaissance period. The virtual museum was, however, created in the 16th century. The antiquities of Rome and other cities were collected in sketchbooks and often published in books and in prints. Some architectural museums, however, already existed in Italy in the late medieval and Renaissance period. They were not specifically created as places where architecture could be studied, but were administrative offices. I refer, obviously, to the collections of drawings, models, and documentation formed by the organizations known as opere or fabbriche, who had the responsibility for building important churches whose construction might last for decades or even centuries. The collections of models and or drawings for the cathedrals of Orvieto and Florence, for instance, survive. A particularly rich and accessible collection is that of the opera of San Petronio in Bologna, which contains models and drawings by Peruzzi, Vignola, Palladio, and others. A particularly, particularly fascinating fabrica would have been that of the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome, where Inigo Jones, for instance, went and saw the still surviving and fantastic model by, uh, after the design of San Gallo for completing St. Peter's. Proto-architectural historians in the Renaissance period were aware of the importance of these collections. Mantegna, Manetti, the Quattrocento biographer Brunelleschi, cites Brunelleschi's project drawing for the facade of the Ospedale degli Unicenti, which he had seen in the office of the Silk Guild in Florence. Family pride led to the preservation of Michelangelo's architectural drawings. His large model for the facade of San Lorenzo is also preserved. In the 16th century, the Medici rulers of Florence assembled a huge and still intact collection of architectural drawings, including hundreds of drawings by Peruzzi and Antonio da San Gallo the Younger and his relations. The original reason for creating this collection may have been military. It contains many plans of fortresses. The presence, however, of these drawings in the Uffizi drawings collection has illuminated the history of Renaissance architecture, a fact which underlines the importance of collections of architectural drawings, like those of the Uffizi and of the RIBA in London, for architectural 
exhibitions and museums. An ancestor of the architectural museum was obviously Renaissance Rome, an entire city, including its modern buildings, its antiquities, and the courtyards and the, where antique culture, architectural fragments were sometimes displayed. In the 16th century, moreover, the virtual museum emerges in the form of collections of architecture presented in architectural books and engravings. The modern architectural museum, however, though it may make use of virtual presentations, still adheres to the concept of the museum as a physical building with a cultural and educational role where the forms of buildings are communicated through models, drawings, and sometimes the display of actual building components, such as capitals. In fact, Sir John Soane's idea of the architectural museum. Can we improve on Sir John Soane? Our distinguished speakers will now let us know. Thank you. <laughs> First, maybe. He is the first, yes. And you, okay. Magic. Well, yeah. being the first, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, this wonderful event. Uh, contrary to my colleagues from the Johnson and Palladio Museum, I don't represent a realized yet museum. Uh, what I'm going to evoke is actually the project of a museum centered on the work of Le Corbusier as well as some issues raised by the project. But since this is about the Museum of Architecture of the Future, uh, this is a future museum, I hope. So I'm representing here the Fondation Le Corbusier, the Le Corbusier Foundation. As some of you may know, Le Corbusier himself did lay out the main features of a foundation to be created after his death in order to transmit his ideas and contribute to the preservation of his work. And here we have uh, one of his projects of status uh, by uh, Le Corbusier himself. The architect had no children, and in many ways, the Le Corbusier Foundation was his child. Uh, we inherited actually not only the drawings, paintings, etc., but also the pyjamas and a couple of his pipes, books, and a couple of other things. Le Corbusier himself negotiated the donation of the most remarkable of the two houses that the foundation occupies in the 16th arrondissement of Paris, the Villa La Roche, that he had built for a Swiss banker. And he left to the foundation his apartment, the Petite Maison on the Geneva Lake, as well as the Cabanon, but that was later entrusted to another institution for a number of practical reasons. So the relation to Le Corbusier has been a constant source of debate each time that the status of the foundation has been modified, and it has been a source of debate when it was when we began to think about creating a museum. Was it true to the intention of Le Corbusier? I'll come back to this issue in a moment. Uh, when I say that the foundation is not a museum, I'm actually simplifying a situation that is a bit more complex. First, because Le Corbusier is among those architects who very early on thought about their legacy and simultaneously led their professional activity and built their archive. Still, he's in his 20s, he famously sent a letter to his parents advocating them to write more interesting stuff to him so that you know, his correspondence later on would, would be really interesting for the readers. He invented also new modes of recording his activity, beginning with his notebooks that mix drawing, text, and more generally, all traces of his professional and, pers and personal activity. And their principle has been emulated since by many architects. I was struck, for example, when you go to the Foster Foundation in Madrid, uh, Sir Richard Foster has actually carnet very much in the Le Corbusier fashion. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that we can keep actually a very large collection of artifacts, one probably of the largest left by a single architect. We keep the archive of something like 400 projects, something like 70 to 80 were realized. We have something like 45 to 50 models, 
15,000 photos. So uh, let's add to that Le Corbusier's book, not only the books he authored, but in his library. Since he was also an artist, we keep uh, paintings, 80 of them, hundreds of drawings, lithographs, sculptures, etc., etc. So a lot of things uh, which is often mobilized for exhibition, and there have been, as you know, regularly exhibition on Le Corbusier, just to show a couple of them. You know, uh, yeah, that was just to illustrate all the things we have, including Venice, and then paintings and sculpture. So exhibition, for example, the 2013 exhibition at MoMA or the 2021-22 exhibition at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. For publication, they're also extremely numerous. There is not a week without uh, publications on Le Corbusier. So the risk is to fall into the category of what Malraux called once the imaginary museum, a collection of iconic work or rather pictorial representation of the work. So, which is one of the reasons the foundation has pushed toward the creation of a fully fledged museum that would enable to present Le Corbusier's work on a both permanent but also flexible way. So we are still to be candid with you in the initial phase of this process uh, that should lead to the creation of such a museum. What I'd like to share are actually a number of the questions raised by such a project. There, some of them are, by the way, not necessarily specific to Le Corbusier. The project is nevertheless linked to the evolution of the foundation. The latter was created with two core mission. The first was to contribute to the preservation of the built work of Le Corbusier, which is often more complex than what might imagine and entails a lot of diplomacy, negotiation, not to mention the technical problems themselves. Chandigarh is a good example. Uh, when dealing with Chandigarh, you don't have only to deal with the intricacy of India, but all sorts of technical and other problems. So this is one of the mission. The other mission is to contribute to the knowledge, understanding, and influence of Le Corbusier's ideas and work and the foundation supports research as much as it can. It has also a public, a publishing activities. We publish, for example, pretty much every year uh, conferences on Le Corbusier. This was one on Le Corbusier and the so-called primitive arts as they were named at the time of his life. So if you like, you know, a remembrance of my 18th century beginnings, a physical and moral mission, if you like. To this day, the foundation has remained faithful to this double mission, but its nature and role has nevertheless changed. Uh, to make a long story short, the first decades of its existence, the foundation functioned a little bit like a club. Although people who had worked for Le Corbusier or known Le Corbusier or being uh, clients of Le Corbusier, in some ways, it was a continuation of the Rue de Sèvres practice and uh, the network of client that revolved around it. And one of the first president was actually André Wojcicki, was the main collaborator of Le Corbusier towards the end of his life. But over time, people who knew intimately Le Corbusier have become more rare, uh, and the foundation has slowly moved toward a function which is more scientific, linked to curation, uh, et cetera, which is a little bit different. Another way to say it would be to say that in the 1980s, there was still the idea that Le Corbusier was part of you know, present-day debates, hence the postmodern fear of the so-called return of Le Corbusier. So good or bad news, I have to tell you, Le Corbusier will not return. He is uh, once and for all part of architectural history, and we have now to deal with him probably a bit closer to us than Brunelleschi, but he belongs like Brunelleschi, Palladio, Johnson, uh, to architectural history. So the role, so the notion of a Le Corbusier museum uh, also is part of this new context. So, but it raises a number of questions. The first one is, what should be the overall purpose of a museum? Is it about celebrating an exceptional contribution to modernism? And probably because I live part of the year in Normandy and the Normandy people are famous for saying to any question, yes and no, I'll begin by a yes and no answer. Uh, the exceptional character 
of the Le Corbusier work is undisputable and was recognized in 2016 when 17 of his work were listed on the World Heritage list. And this was the uh, Istanbul meeting there. So a museum bearing the name of Le Corbusier should recognize that, just like with Palladio and other remarkable architect. But at the same time, it's worth noting that Le Corbusier is not an isolated figure. He had many collaborators, some of them quite famous, from Charlotte Perriand to Yanis Xenakis here with Le Corbusier. And some of his production are inseparable from this collaboration. La Tourette, for example, and Brussels, the Brussels Pavilion are in, a, in practice co-authored by Xenakis and Le Corbusier. So it's probably as interesting to consider that Le Corbusier is a gate, an entry point to the larger question of modernism and uh, modernity. And this all the more that the work is not limited to architecture and urbanism. As I mentioned, it includes furniture, tapestries, painting, sculpture. So one thing to note, by the way, is there's been a shift in the interest of Le Corbusier. In a few decades ago, Le Corbusier was mostly interesting because of the 1920s, 1930s. Now Le Corbusier is benefiting from the hype of the 1950s, 1960s. Interestingly, by the way, an architect like Perret benefits from the same thing. This is the, um, this is the sample apartment in Le Havre, which has been a very successful enterprise. And the question, for example, of the interior has become a key question in Le Cor the interest for Le Corbusier. And it was, for example, one of the dimensions of Jean-Louis Cohen's exhibition at MoMA with, for example, reconstitution of his interiors, such as here, the Cabanon. So one of the ambitions of this museum is, of course, to celebrate Le Corbusier's work, but, uh, but to actually to explore the complexity of modernism and its legacy. Going beyond the caricature that are still prevailing about modernity and that still find a broad echo, and here a theater play on the theme, this is the fault of Le Corbusier, for those who can read French, c'est la faute à Le Corbusier. So going a bit further than these pretty simplifying statements. So this should be a museum that should not only show Le Corbusier's work, but like many museums of architecture, welcome exhibition on other major protagonists of modernity, why not Alto, why not Gropius, etc. And also themes related to the modernist heritage, social housing, modernism and technology, modernism and nature. It's, by the way, interesting to note that there is now a rediscovery of the complexity of the relation between uh, modernism and the question of natural elements. This is the mill owners in Abedabad, and you know, for Le Corbusier, uh, you know, the question of nature uh, was constantly present in his work, from his early interest into the question of the garden city to his latter interest into planted facades and buildings. So. As we all know today, a museum is hard to make function, so one of the ideas would have to have a limited core exhibit, because as we know, you know, it's exhibition that attract on the long-term people, and then have a series of exhibition. So one of the problems also is to what extent are you biographical? To what extent are you thematic? One of the ambition is actually to articulate the two, to play on the life of Le Corbusier, who went through a number of phases, pre-war, post-war, etc. And but articulate with, with theme. It's pretty clear, for example, that the question of mechanization is a very important question in the 1920s, 1930s. It's less important in the 1950s, where all the theme appear. There are also difficult questions. For example, Le Corbusier was the center at the, uh, of a polemic a few years ago about his political affiliation dur uh, sh during World War I and World War II with a number of spectacular but highly disputable uh, publications like this one, Le Corbusier of French Fascism. Uh, truth is, we have letters of Le Corbusier explicitly stating that he was never a fascist, but he flirted with authoritarian regime. Uh, ironically, by the way, the so-called fascist of the 1930 built his big, largest commission in the 1930 is in the Soviet Union. Uh, so probably not fascist, but definitely authoritarian. Speaking of that, 
One of the interests is that it's still a big question when, for example, a, a very famous Danish architect, whom I will not n n name, but posed next to Bolsonaro in the name of sustainable development uh, that design can contribute to, were in the core of this ambiguity of the relation between architecture and politics. So, it's, so it should really pr provide us with opportunities to articulate past and present. Speaking of present, this is for us an essential question, how to mobilize Le Corbusier's work with future generation in mind, which is what Museum of the Future means. So there are three possible answers uh, for, for us at the foundation. First, the legacy of modernism. Even if Latour famously said that we've never been modern, actually we've been modern and we still live, in many cases, in the legacy of modernism. So we have to understand it, we have to understand what happened, and even if you know, the unité d'habitation are not reducible to the common modernist production, etc., understanding modernism, what it meant, what it means today to live within its, uh, with its legacy is a question. A second question is still just like with Palladio, the emotion why we have to transmit the aesthetic pleasure, the complexity, and the emotion. And of course, you know, Palladio's Villa, by the way, are a great example. And it's, let's go back to the famous parallel uh, stage by Colin Rowe between Palladio and, uh, Le, and Le Corbusier, couldn't resist, sorry. Uh, but uh, we have to make understandable, you know, the aesthetic choices, the values of aesthetic values of this work. And third, for us, you know, how does architecture in a, in a given context cope with this context? In other words, a lesson in the relevance of design for society and culture. How does also architecture relate to the other arts? One of the interests, again, of Le Corbusier is that he enables to touch so many aspects of the visual arts. In terms of muse museography, we're thinking again, we're not going to exhibit uh, thousands of artifacts we have, but we have to make choices, organize uh, a, a kind of revolving presentation, etc. And we're thinking very much about VR uh, in order to complement the experiment. But I have to say, I've worked a lot in the past years about digital architecture, etc. but virtual reality is probably not a panacea. And we believe that the actual contact with real buildings is fundamental. Uh, which is, with, and with the case of Le Corbusier, there are at least two problems which are not solvable with the digital only. The first is actually scale. It's very difficult to know uh, really, uh, this is uh, Casa Curucet, which is actually a very, very small building. But even like, uh, for those who've seen Ronchamp, Ronchamp looks very monumental on many photographs. It's actually a pretty small building. So scale is not at all evident in Le Corbusier. And sometimes in the same buildings, you have, have discrepancy in scale, which are very spectacular. And the second is, of course, the materiality of the building. Whatever one says, you know, the contact with the building is essential. So because of that, we have been looking for sites in close to a Le Corbusier building. Of course, we cannot put all the Le Corbusier building in a cluster around the museum, but at least find a building. So, which is why after a lot of going back and forth, you know, talking to people in Paris, Marseille, and other places, uh, we decided to strike a deal with Poissy, which is a city, uh, of course, for the core Parisian, it looks awfully uh, far from Paris, but it's actually a 20 minute uh, metro ride. And above all, it has the Villa Savoie which is with still today the number one in terms of right before uh, falling water. Neil Levin is always my former colleague furious about that, but still supersedes uh, falling water as the number one modernist villa reference. So the idea would be so to this, you have the Villa Savoie, uh, this little square here, to occupy this ground in which the city of Poissy had a lot of projects that they decided to abandon to try to promote a Le Corbusier thing. So the museum would also solve a number of current issues like storage. We do have a problem of storage. It's costing us extremely expensive. We used to store a lot of things in an underground facility at Villa La Roche, which got inundated at some point, so it's not very good. Uh, 
So the idea is also to demultiply the outreach of the foundation. So there are challenges for sure. You know, the distance for Paris, you know, I'm trying to minimize it, but still, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, it entails, among other things, finding additional pu public. Villa Savoie, it's roughly 40,000 people a year, visitors a year, but, you know, to find an equilibrium, uh, we need 100,000 visitors. So how to find them, which means also finding local public. Uh, local public, actually, Poissy is part of a conurbation of half a million people called Paris uh, uh, West. So that could be a solution, but knowing that this is economically a fragile zone. Uh, but one of the interesting thing is that, so this is Villa Savoie, the idea is actually to integrate the villa, we've been in discussion, into, to the museum. So the villa would be actually the major artifact of the museum, if you like, but also a place for display, uh, you know, in a limited fashion, since you, uh, this is difficult space. So, but to go back to the site, speaking of the legacy of modernism, this is, for example, Mont La Jolie. We're right in the middle of the problem. So, so how to mobilize, especially young people, seems to me one of the big challenges we're facing is how to interest young people into the work of an architect who is really an old guy. He was born at the end of the 19th century. Can you believe it? So. Oh, a lot of challenges. I would say we were almost about to succeed, really, strike the deal, and then the pandemic came, and then we have to restart, because as you know, the economy in France is not much better than elsewhere, but we haven't received yet one of the bombs of Putin, so everything is good. Uh, but it's not the easier thing. Uh, it me something also to note, because it's a conurbation, we need also to think more in terms not only of a central siege, but a network, a network of places, etc., which we is leading us slowly to rethink of the museum not as a single place, but a network of places. We're envisaging, for example, also to put things in saint dié where there is a factory of Le Corbusier and an owner which is interested in having, you know, a little exhibition, etc. I would say that an architecture museum is not only about building something, it's also about reconsidering problems. One of the thing we've done because of this museum perspectives is finally to catalog properly our collections, which is not yet finished because it's an enormous task, but uh, we are getting there. I'll finish on two things, uh, on a couple of things. Schinkel famously said that the role of the architect was to ennoble human relationships. We believe that a museum of architecture is, of course, about the experience of architecture, but it's also about values. Values that we hope are not going to look antiquated, etc. And in the case of Le Corbusier, probably two values that seem to us important. The first is humanism. Le Corbusier did believe in the interest of the human, the force of the human, its creativity, etc. And the second that we have tendency to forget these days is optimism. Uh, modernism was about an optimistic take about the future. And we think that a museum on Le Corbusier should convey these humanistic but also optimistic take on things, even if optimism, I'm aware that this might not be the easiest thing to achieve these days. Uh, so we believe that, you know, the hand of Le Corbusier you know, Le Corbusier loved this kind of symbol. They're, 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 they did mean something for him. So once again, it's a project, Museum for the Future, and I thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank Antoine Picon for this very comprehensive and uh, illuminating account of the problems of a museum and institution which uh, focuses on a particular great, great architect. And it's now my pleasure to uh, call Bruce Boucher to the podium, uh, a very distinguished former pupil of mine, I'm proud to say, <laughs> uh, scholar, um, made major contributions to the history of architecture, and now 
he finds himself face to face living in the same building <laughs> during the daytime yes. uh, as Sir John's son, Bruce Boucher. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, and uh, buongiorno a tutti. It's a great pleasure to be back at, in Vicenza, and I want to thank the uh, Centro Andrea Palladio for the invitation, and um, as Howard mentioned, it's a special pleasure to be here with Il Mio Maestro. Um, the first time I was here was 49 years ago in 1973 with Howard. We were both a little younger then, but uh, uh, he introduced me to the Mondo Palladiano, which from which I've never emerged, I don't think. But today I'm talking about John Soane, and I, I have to say that John Soane was not a great admirer of Palladio. Um, he would uh, incline his head, but his uh, feelings about Palladio were rather complicated, as was true, I think, of many architects of the period of the late 18th, early 19th century. So I want to talk about his museum and I'm beginning with the design perspective that he did for the front elevation of number 13, Lincoln's Inn Field. This building um, has cast a spell over generations of visitors, invoking delight, but also provoking, at times, bafflement, if not confusion. Its creator, and here we see John Soane in 1804, uh, its creator intended it to be a repository of all that was best for the formation of a modern architect. More generally, the house and its collections were conceived as an academy for the enlightenment of the general public as well as a catalyst for the creation of new art by future generations. The density of the display, which you can see here in a view of the dome area, which is the heart of the museum, the density of this display and the juxtaposition of Greek, Roman, medieval, and even non-Western objects can seem puzzling. To be sure, elements of this display can find points of comparison in other collections of the period, yet there's much about the Soane Museum that is sui generis. This can be explained in part because it is a rare survivor of a kind of private house museum that was common in the London of Soane's day. At the same time, the perennial fascination of Soane and his creation reflects its place on the cusp of the shift from the Renaissance cabinet of curiosities towards the post-Enlightenment museum. And this is a 1813 watercolor by one of his uh, assistants um, named uh, Joseph Michael Gandhi of the same dome area as it appeared in 1813 at night lit by artificial light. At the same time, the Soane is much more than the sum of its parts and is one of the most intensely autobiographical statements conceived in three-dimensional terms. It has been said that every portrait is a portrait of the artist, and this observation can be applied to the display of Soane's house and museum. Yet there is a paradox in Soane's self-portrait for while the architect appears both directly and indirectly throughout, he remains an elusive presence, rather like the reflections in the convex mirrors that adorn so many corners of the building. In the opening of his privately printed guide to his collection, John Soane famously said that the works were arranged as studies for my own mind. Yet he never explained what he meant by that phrase. While it is clear that Soane wanted to direct the visitor's attention to individual objects as well as clusters, such as we see here, he withheld the key to the meaning, being content to scatter breadcrumbs of information for later generations to pick up. And this was also characteristic of the way that John Soane engaged with the world at large, a, a mixture of generosity and combativeness. Because the display of the Soane Museum is so personal, it is necessary to consider briefly the man behind the extraordinary achievement that is Sir John Soane's museum before turning to the collection itself. John Soane, we see him here at a portrait of 1776, was born at Goring-on-Thames in Oxfordshire in 1753, even older than Corbusier. 
Although his family had connections with the building trade, they were modest at best. Both his father and his brother William were bricklayers, and John's working life began in a similar manner. Like Michelangelo, who also curated his own biography, John Soane would later brush over these early years of manual labor and merely refer to a natural inclination to study architecture as the vehicle for his advancement. He was fortunate to enter the office of an older cosmopolitan architect named George Dance, who encouraged him to study at the schools of the recently created Royal Academy, which were free as then as they are now. Sohn distinguished himself as a scholar, and his success was crowned with a gold medal presented to him by the Academy's first president, Sir Joshua Reynolds, in 1776, the year this painting was made, as well as a traveling stipend for study in Italy. So between 1778 and 1780, Sohn participated in a kind of student version of the Grand Tour attaching himself often to wealthier travelers and making contacts that accelerated his career upon his return to London. But Soane did not rise through talent alone. His wife was an heiress whose wealth enabled him to build his dream houses in Lincoln's Inn Field and to amass important artifacts that he left to the nation on his death in 1837. Still, fate didn't smile upon Soane the early death of his wife led to the, his estrangement from his two sons, and many of his most important buildings, the Bank of England, the law courts at Westminster, we see here again in a, a watercolor, or the Masonic Lodge in Great Queen Street, were subsequently consumed either by demolition or fire. Soane had compared the facade of his building, number 13, sorry, to the prologue to a play, preparing the visitor to some extent for what lay inside. Here, drawing upon classical, medieval, and even modernist elements, Soane created something unexpected, something, as one of his contemporaries perceptively put it, less fettered by classical precedent. Completed in 1813, the facade is built of Portland stone and projects a little over a meter in advance of the line of the terrace houses on the north side of the fields. Surprisingly, there are no classical orders here, but rather incised vertical lines suggesting pilasters or the ghost of pilasters. As you can see, there are four Gothic pedestals which came from Westminster Hall where he was building the law courts. Um, and above, there are two copies of Caryatids from the Erechtheum in the recently invented synthetic material known as code stone. The overall proportions of the facade were spoilt by the addition of a full upper story in 1825, but it did bring the facade in line with the buildings on either side, number 12, which was his first house, and number 14, which he built in the 1820s. The over, um, Soane clearly intended this facade to be provocative, and in this he was all too successful. A contemporary magazine of 1812 recorded a variety of reactions to Soane's facade. Some found it pleasing, while others condemned the facade as a newfangled projection or a palpable eyesore. And one can imagine seeing something like this in 1813 would have been uh, striking and startling. And in fact, Soane was taken to court over it by the district surveyor because it did project beyond the line of the other terrace houses. But Soane did win the case, so the facade remained. The interior of the house is mildly unconventional in its flow of space and wall colors which were inspired by Pompeian wall, directions, wall decorations which Soane had admired as a young man. It also makes prolific use of mirrors, as I mentioned, both convex and conventional, to multiply the illusion of space while colored and stained glass, and stained glass create an atmosphere that early visitors like, likened to Mediterranean sun. And here we're looking at 
an alcove that was finished in 1825 with the entablature of the Temple of Castor and Pollux, and, it's, and also some medieval and uh, Egyptian and Greek plaster casts all put together. Um, and it's top lit by a skylight which has yellow colored glass to create this um, special interior mood. Initially, Soane's architectural practice operated behind the house proper in what would have originally been a yard or stables in the square, which had been laid out in 1640. And in this area, running between, behind three houses, we have today what Soane would refer to as the museum proper. Um, just to explain what we're looking at here, this is number 13 in the middle, but Soane moved to this area in 1792, rebuilt this house, and his architectural practice was originally back here. In 1808, he bought number 13, and eventually he persuaded the tenant to swap houses with him. He rebuilt this one and expropriated this from number 12, and then in the 1820s, early 1823, he bought number 14, rebuilt the house as a rental house, and took the yard and attached it to number 13. So number 13 today has the shape, the, the plan of it has the shape of, a letter, of the letter T. And this is the area that I want to talk about next, which is the, the dome area. The focal point of this suite of galleries is the dome area, so-called because its skylight has the for form of a dome. To enter this area is like stepping into the mind of a neoclassical architect. Under the dome, visitors are surrounded by marbles and plaster casts of classical and later architectural elements, as well as burial urns, busts, and in the crypt below, an Egyptian sarcophagus, which we see here in a watercolor of 1825, shortly after it was installed in the, in the crypt. This is the heart of the museum, and at one end stands the bust of John Soane, looking across the sarcophagus towards a plaster copy of the Apollo Belvedere, which we saw a few minutes ago, as if for inspiration, for light, illumination. As you can see, Soane's bust is flanked by diminutive figures of Raphael and Michelangelo, which had been created by his friend and fellow Royal Academician, John Flaxman. The message conveyed by this placement appears to be that Soane felt himself to be in direct descent from these great figures, and he would have endorsed their belief that one could not be a great architect if one was not also a great artist. Given Soane's pessimistic cast of mind, the tableau may also indicate that he believed he represented the end of a great tradition, one stretching back through the Renaissance to antiquity, or as his, son George, as his son George sardonically observed, John Soane literally installed himself in the great tradition he so venerated. John Soane died in January of 1837. Four years, later, four years earlier, he had lobbied Parliament for an act to preserve his house and collection for the public use. This was a novel and indeed a controversial gesture at the time which engendered a certain amount of debate then and subsequently. In particular, it was seen that, uh, as unnatural that he was giving his inheritance, his wealth, to a museum and not to his surviving family. In the end, Soane prevailed and the Act of Parliament of 1833 vested numbers 12 and 13 in Lincoln's in Fields of Lincoln's Inn Field in trustees, who were instructed to give free access to the public, and I quote, at least on two days in every week throughout the months of April, May, and June, and at such other times as the said trustees shall direct to amateurs and students in painting, sculpture, and architecture, for consulting and inspecting and benefiting by the said collection. It continues, the trustees and their successors shall not accept in the case of absolute necessity, suffer the arrangements of the said museum to be altered. 
In other words, Soane wanted no material changes to the house and collection as he left it. The bulk of his fortune, some 30,000 pounds, several million in today's terms, would be set aside as an endowment and interest from its investment together with the rental income of number 12 would provide an income to support the running of the museum. And this financial settlement lasted over 100 years. But Soane hereby set up problems that successive curators and trustees grappled with for the next century and a half. The first visitors were admitted to the museum by ticket, sorry, in April of 1837. But there was continuing puzzlement among the pub public over the purpose of the museum as well as the qu quixotic nature of Soane's architectural legacy. The anomaly lay in trying to turn a private house into a public resource. After an initial wave of visitors in 1837, which reached as high as 10,000 people, numbers dropped to around two or 3,000 a year and remained there for much of the rest of the century, partly because it was only open two or three days a week and closed for five months of the year. A newspaper article of 1859 commented tartly the museum is visited by hundreds instead of thousands. The books and drawings are safe and untouched, carefully locked up and useless. There is indeed a locked up air about the whole house. Visitors, when they have obtained a card and gained admittance, feel that they are there on sufferance and would no more think of asking for a case or a drawer to be opened than they would in any private house to which they had gained access by, by courtesy of the proprietor to glance at the pictures. It could be said that Johnson's single-minded focus on preserving his house and collections unaltered posed insurmountable difficulties. But changes began occurring early on in order to make the collections more visible and accessible. For example, one of the most famous works in the collection, Hogarth's eight paintings named A Rake's Progress, were removed from the picture room and placed on folding stands in the South Drawing Room in 1849, remaining there until 1891. And this is an illustration from a magazine of 1880 showing the South Drawing Room as it appeared in those days with uh, a woman uh, examining the paintings and some other treasures um, from the picture room which were moved there, particularly the Anglo-Indian ivory table and, and matching chairs. Indeed, many of the changes that were put into effect in the latter part of the 19th century were attempts to grapple with the issue of accessibility, more particularly uh, with lighting before the introduction of electricity, which only occurred in 1897. Just to give you an example of some of these changes, uh, the an sorry, I must be pressing it too heavily. The anteroom off the breakfast room, uh, which you see on the right as it was restored in 2016 to its original form and shape, was enlarged and most of its contents removed uh, in the late 1880s. The Cork model of Pompeii, as it appeared in 1820, was cut in half. The stand on which it, was, uh, it stood was reduced in size, and it was removed from the second floor to the first floor north drawing room um, at the same time. The south drawing room, which we saw in the illustration a few minutes ago with Hogarth's Rake's Progress, um, was filled with display cases. So many of the treasures of the museum, like the illumination by Giulio Clovio, early editions of uh, books, etc., were eas more easily uh, accessible. Indeed, um, at the same time, the very um, purpose of the museum continued to be questioned by the public. In the 1920s, the building and collection were informally restyled as Sir John Soane's House and Museum, 
And although that title never became official, it spoke to a dual mandate which the trustees of the day pursued. In 1938, a blue ribbon panel, which was concerned with making museums more accessible to the public, had the Soane Museum in its sights. Their recommendations included making the open hour, opening hours more convenient to the public, as well as appointing a committee of museum experts to rearrange the contents of the Soane so that it could be better seen. When the matter was raised in Parliament that same year, the government expressed the view that as the museum was a private foundation, it did not want to ask Parliament to intervene in its management. The following year, 1939, Sir Reginald Blumfield, an architect and architectural historian of note, spoke out as the chairman of the trustees of the Soane and defended the status quo by pointing out that the Soane was not, and I quote, a public museum supported by the taxpayer, but a private museum established and maintained by a specific bequest. Rumfield's de defense was not entirely accurate, yet it re re represented what might be called the groupthink of the trustees and their very narrow interpretation of their mandate. This stalemate prevailed until after the Second World War, when damage from enemy action and inadequate maintenance left the house and galleries in a precarious state. It was at this point that Sir John Summerson assumed the role of creator, of curator, and steered the trustees towards reconsidering their rather restricted view of the museum's mandate. He wrote in 1945, shortly after taking up the role, during nearly the whole of its existence, the museum has been subject to criticism for its failure to render an adequate service to students and to exhibit its material in a worthy manner to the public. There is no question, he continued, that a policy of sympathetic and progressive reform can be and must be pursued to establish the museum in public esteem. And in fact, the restoration of Sir John Soane's museum as we know it today actually began at this time and largely through the efforts of Sir John Summerson, whom we see here in an undated photograph in the breakfast room of number 13. Indeed, Summerson remained in post for 40 years until 1984. He laid the foundations for changing what has been described as an agreeable, if largely inaccessible, curiosity into a small museum of international repute. He engineered an important stage in the restoration of number 13 by persuading the trustees to reoccupy number 12, which had been rented for income. Uh, and this occurred in 1969. The scope of this move was to expand the capabilities of the museum by decanting workspaces from the fabric of number 13. And this policy continued under the curatorship of his successors. Summerson also attempted to buy back number 14 in 1962, but he was unsuccessful in that. The uh, number 14 in Soane's will had been left to his grandchildren and, uh, in fact, was tied up in a, a legal case until the 1870s. And at the time of its purchase by the trustees in 1996, it was essentially law offices like so many of the buildings around Lincoln's Inn Field. The, um, when the trustees were able to purchase the freehold of number 14, this acquisition paved the way for a seven-year campaign called Opening Up the Sone, which took place between 2009 and 2016. This complex project had a number of interrelated goals, the rest restoring additional historic areas and opening them to the public. And two examples of this were the recreation of the Tivoli access, an alcove on the second floor that had in 1917 been converted into a lavatory to meet the needs of the public. Um, this was reconverted into what was, what Soane intended it to be, namely a gallery of modern or contemporary British sculpture. And also, 
the recreation of what Sohn referred to as an architectural pasticcio, that is a column of architectural fragments resting on a Roman altar, which had been taken down in 1896 as unstable. It was recreated uh, in the early 2000s with a steel rod in the middle to make sure that uh, it was stable. And it's a, just a, as a slight digression, it, it's a very Pyrenaean uh, structure, but also it reflected ideas that were very fashionable at the time, which uh, Sohn imbibed. Namely, this is, he thought, was a Hindu capital, but actually it's Moroccan. And so it's resting on a Roman altar, a Hindu capital, and then above a copy of uh, the capitals of the Temple of Vesta at Tivoli, surmounted by uh, a finial, such as you would see in a um, Christopher Wren church. The idea is that there is a commonality between East and West in uh, antiquity, um, a kind of migration of images and architectural forms. During this period of the 1990s and the early 2000s, work was underway to rehabilitate uh, number, 20, uh, number 12 um, and uh, number 14. This is a photograph which shows the number 12 while it was being uh, restored. Uh, looking at the staircase, the cantilevered staircase that he created there, and um, improving visitor facilities. Um, for instance, adding a lift which gave disabled access to the museum as a whole, the introduction of a shop and um, galleries for temporary exhibitions and two conservation studios. The lifts were installed because there were three closets which were one on top of the other. So it was possible in a listed building to introduce uh, something of, of this sort, which was um, a great uh, access, a, a great win for the building because otherwise uh, people with uh, disabilities were really limited in what they could see in the museum. On the first floor, on the first floor were new temporary exhibition galleries which were opened in 2012 in, in number 12 and it's really a, a Sonian interior which has been restored and uh, cases and wall cases were created so that uh, we could have a proper place for uh, temporary exhibitions. And then on the floor above, uh, purpose-built conservation studios, two conservation studios, which were opened in 2012. Uh, before that, um, the only area for conservation was a sink, which was also used for people uh, washing up their lunches. The most extraordinary of these changes was the recreation on the second, second floor of number 13 of the model room as it appeared in the 1830s, which you can see here on the lower right. It was an illustration from Soane's privately printed uh, guide to the museum. Um, in the 19, 19th century, this area had been turned into offices because Soane didn't really plan for offices or even consultation rooms for people who wanted to look at, at his collections. So um, this was, in fact, the director's office in the time of John Summerson and down really to the early 2000s. And this is more or less as it appears today with the, uh, the model platform with the Pompeian uh, structure recreated and other cork models and also models below of Soane's own architecture and plaster models too of reconstructions of antiquity, a sort of compendium of ancient and, and modern architecture that Soane um, used for instruction of his pupils and also for the general public. Here is uh, Mrs. Soane's more, maybe I should try doing this instead. Uh, Mrs. Soane's morning room, uh, more or less as it appears today, we've also added a, a carpet which corresponds to the carpet that was there in the early 19th century. And this was the way it looked in um, the, early 2000s. 
we could do this because every time Soane finished a room, he had his studio do a watercolor. And also from 1833, from his own lifetime, there were inventories of everything that was on the walls. Oh, am I going backwards? Yes. Um, as we heard earlier, the, um, the use of uh, the internet is vital for a small museum, as it is for, for even larger ones, um, because the changes and expansions in the footprint of the Soane Museum corresponded with a steady increase in the number of visitors, which rose from 10,000 in the 1950s to over 100,000 since the beginning of this century. Throughout this period, the challenge has remained reconciling improvements with the idiosyncratic character and unique atmosphere of the Soane Museum. Our online collection went live in 2016. This is a screenshot of a page of it. And over 40,000 objects are now accessible. Oops. I'm sorry. Are now accessible with a brief description and references for further research. We also introduced a fly through to the building. I'm sorry, this thing keeps jumping. Um, a fly through for the building, which um, is called Explore Sewn, and you can find this uh, on the web if you just type in Explore Sewn. Initially, it was limited to two sites the model room on the second floor and the sarcophagus of the Egyptian pharaoh Seti in the um, crypt. But this year, it's been significantly expanded to include the picture room, which we see here in an axonometric projection, which contains 118 works of art and can now be, all of which can be accessed virtually. And this is, again, a screenshot from one of the works, one of the um, recreations of uh, Soane's architectural projects by Joseph Michael Gandhi with a description of it. So th they can all be accessed virtually. And in fact, during the lockdown, during uh, the lockdown, uh, this took on uh, a new life. And it was mentioned by the New York Times and by other um, journals um, as being uh, noteworthy. And so this gave us, a, in a sense, a, the impetus to continue to add. And I think the goal will be to try to have as much of the house as possible available online for people to look at all over the world. Let me conclude by just touching on exhibitions. Sohn wanted his museum to be a living academy, not just a house museum. His concept of architecture, as I've said, involved all the arts, including music and landscape design. He bought and commissioned works by contemporary artists and earlier artists, and he hoped that future designers, architects, and artists would be inspired by his collection to create new works. Since the turn of the 21st century, we have tried to combine historic exhibitions that derive from our collection, as with a major uh, exhibition showing works by William Hogarth in 2019, and contemporary exhibitions. Um, and I'm showing you here two of them. In 2017, the sculptor Mark Quinn came to us and proposed making works that responded to Soane's interest in sculptural fragments. He did 17 uh, works, and this is one of them, which is flanked by two of Soane's casts of the Medici uh, Venus. And on the right, you can see our most recent exhibition, which was called Space Popular, which was an exploration of augmented reality inspired by Soane's fascination with liminality, that is, with uh, mirrors, with picture panels that open and closed. And um, the architectural firm called Space Popular, which created this exhibition, were, in fact, inspired by Soane's interest in these similar sorts of experiences as perceived in the early 19th century. We've also um, stepped up our educational pro programs. There they go. Um, and 
I think it, this is really something that's very important because we try to work with local schools to introduce children to the idea of architecture, indeed engineering, uh, and the built environment and their stake in it. Um, and it's particularly important because now most states run schools um, push the arts to the sidelines. So therefore we're providing uh, an important means for children from eight to 18 and also um, undergraduate and postgraduates to use the resources of the SOAN. And also, we five years ago, we started a program with people suffering from Alzheimer's to, who come with specially trained assistants, look at works in the museum, and then go to our art center in the basement of number 14 and make art as a kind of therapy. Finally, in retrospect, I would just say that one can detect a synchronicity between the rehabilitation of Sir John Soane's museum and the rehabilitation of Soane's reputation as an architect. The latter took a century to achieve, for throughout the 19th century, Soane's work was damned with faint praise or simply damned as willfully eccentric. In the 20th century, Soane was hailed by modernists and postmodernists as a prophet of their movements. And this, in turn, kindled renewed interest in Soane's museum. Most people today would agree that it is fortunate that the museum was not reorganized along conventional lines or according to chronological genres in the last century. I think we can recognize now that the 19th century concept of the museum as a systematic and impersonally organized presentation of objects, a, comp a concept that prevailed well into the 20th century, is only one way of looking at history. Our renewed A renewed interest in earlier museums and in cabinets of curiosity from which they emerged reflects a desire to pursue diverse epistemological paths and to reconsider the museum per se as an architect archaeological site worthy of exploration. In this way, one can say that the 21st century has caught up with Sir John Soane. Thank you. I'd like to th thank Bruce Boucher very much for this e e extremely clear uh, picture of uh, the, the history of the building and its collections and uh, congratulate him on, on his paper but also on his, his activity as director of one of the most extraordinary museums in, in the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's now my, my pleasure to introduce someone who needs no introduction, Guido Beltramini, director of the, the Palladio Center, someone who has transformed the activities of the center, who has progressively built the museum here and added a great deal to the possibility of uh, understanding and coming closer to the architecture and the world of Palladio and his successors, Guido. Thank you, Howard. Thank you to everybody. And when we began thinking about a museum dedicated to Palladio, we had two points clearly in mind. First, the museum had to be primarily made up of Palladio's works and therefore it would embrace the historic center of Vicenza, the Veneto countryside, and towns with his churches, bridges, and city gates. The new Palladio Museum would have to relate to these buildings, their context, and the people who live there. Of course, we couldn't bring the buildings into the museum, with one exception, Palazzo Barbaran. So, we had to focus on Palladio's creative personality to provide a setting in which to narrate how he conceived and realized his project and how he communicated his idea of architecture. Second point, the Palladio Museum had to be a resource and tool for our research center, the 
Andrea Palladio International Center for Studies on Architecture, or Palladio Center for, for short. The museum would communicate the results of our studies to a wider audience than specialists and academics. So the research aspect to be so the research aspect had to be a visible part of the museum. This meant conceiving a flexible museum always with work in progress. It meant having a museum where it was possible to easily update the, content, the contents in the various rooms as the results of new research emerged. It meant equipping the museum with spaces for small temporary dossier exhibitions, not only devoted to Palladio. In the last analysis, it meant creating a workshop museum in which ongoing research was being shown and communicated. The closest, the closest example that came to mind was the Page Museum at La Brea, Los Angeles, when visitors can see paleontologists analyzing fragments of dinosaurs extracted from the tar pits nearby. The Palladio Center had been created in the aftermath of the Second World War bombing, which had damaged Palladio's building in Vicenza. One night in March 1945, British bombs hit the roof of the Basilica Palladiana, causing a devastating, fair, a devastating fire. An eyewitness told me that molten copper from the roof of the Basilica could be seen pouring down through the Basilica's huge gutter spouts. The Palazzo Valmarana also was almost destroyed. The city administrators decided that to rebuild the damaged monuments, they needed to create a research center, the Palladio Center. The first president was Guglielmo Cappelletti, and he described the difficulties of rebuilding Vicenza as follows. I quote Cappelletti declaring, I began to take an interest in Palladio immediately after the last war for the problem of reconstructing the city after the destruction caused by the war. The work of reconstruction raised a number of tricky issues for which the premises for the solution were in the Palladian texts and critical literature. For example, for example the rebuilding of the sheep's keel roof of the basilica. There were no modern surveys of the roof, and to rebuild it, we turn to the engravings in the Quattro Libri, published in 1570, or those of Bertotti Scamozzi, published in 1776. Guglielmo Cappelletti was a Christian Democrat who had fought fasci against fascism, in, and in 1946, he was a member of the Constituent Assembly of the Italian Republic. When he had time off from the constitutional debate, he wandered around rare bookstalls and began to put together the largest ever collection of books on Palladio. On his death, he left the collection to the center. In 1958, Cappelletti and the other Byzantine administrators asked to Anthony Blunt, to André Chastel, to Lud Ludwig Heiderreich, to Rodolfo Palucchini, Rudolf Wittkober, Bruno Zevi, and others to join the academic committee of the Centro, with Renato Cevese as funding director. These scholars shared the desire to create a study center for the history of architecture in which an international community of scholars could meet and work together and go beyond the various national schools. In the following decades, with the arrival of other members like James Ackerman, Arnold Dobruski, Manfredo Tafuri, Christoph Tenes, Howard Burns, and Christoph Frommel, the focus on Palladio was widened to take in the whole Renaissance. Their idea was to develop the history of Renaissance architecture and free it from its subordinate status as the younger sister of the history of art. They placed contents and drawings at the center of their approach to history of the Renaissance in the wake of Ackermann's studies on the Cortile del Belvedere and Michelangelo architecture. Renaissance drawings were no longer to be examined as images as the art historians have done until then. 
they were now to be interpreted as the tools used by architects to conceive and develop their projects and communicate them to patrons, craftsmen, and readers. This meant developing a new kind of scholarship involving interpreting drawings, establishing their orthography, and describing their media, materials, and techniques. There was a growing emphasis on working drawings rather than on presentation drawings, which had attracted collectors for centuries. Alongside the Renaissance drawing, the, this new generation of historians attach great importance to survey drawings capable of providing an image not only of the form of the building, but also of its physical consistency, its materials, and its various phases. The interest in historic drawings and survey was complemented by radically new focus on drawings of reconstruction of unrealized projects making it possible to write not only the history of the victors, their realized buildings, but also the history of buildings that remain on paper. Reconstructing unrealized projects from drawings marked the fundamental turning point since it meant exploring the architect's creative personality rather than simply considering his built works. Unrealized projects in architecture often have groundbreaking innovative features. At the same time, there was a much greater focus on contents to situate projects in their historical period and go beyond seeing architectural history only as the history of architectural forms. This meant including the commissioning, politics, and economics of projects. The shift was thus from a history of object to a history of people who had made them architects, patrons, and communities. These themes are taken for granted today, not entirely perhaps, but at the time they were only just beginning to be explored for the Renaissance architecture. The group of architectural historians who came together in the Palladio Center believed it was necessary to dismantle the big pictures made by the previous generation of historians. In doing so, they rarely resorted to monographs and publish articles in academic journals dealing with specific aspects. Their means of communication, the means of communication with the wider public outside the academic community, were architectural, uh, architectural exhibitions and their catalogues, which took on a new role. By the way, I believe that this kind of exhibition relating with the architect of the, of the past would have been possible without the great interest in architectural drawings that emerged from the debate on postmodernism between practicing architects in the 70s and 80s. The Palladio Center played a key role in shaping the way architectural history was narrated. The exhibition in 1980 and 1990s that Burns, Tafuri, Frommel, Bruschi, and Fiore dedicated to Raphael as architect in Rome 1984, in Giulio Romano in Mantua 1989, and Francesco Di Giorgio in Siena 1994 were discussed in Vicenza. Indeed, the Palladio Center had already organized the first major exhibition of architecture dedicated to Palladio in the Basilica in Vicenza in 1973. And it was followed by the Palladio exhibition in London in 1975, curated by a young Howard Burns with a much younger Bruce Boucher and Linda Ferber. <laughs> the Vicenza exhibition still presented the black and white Palladio based on the neoclassical interpretation. It was dominated by large models which were 3D representations of the illustration of the Quattro Libri, <coughs> absolute forms out of their time. The London exhibition, Howard and Bruce, on the other hand, shown Palladio as an architect in his time within the economic, political, and social context in line with the material history studies of the French Annals group. The models were seen in relation to drawings, fragments of antique architecture, portraits of patron, paintings depicting the life of the time, 16th century drafting tools, coins, even 16th century farm tours like plows, butter chants, and sickles. In fact, 
When conceiving the Palladio Museum 10 years ago, we had Howard and Bruce vision in mind and their little square catalog was always on our table. The ingredients for the Palladio Museum were rootedness in the local area, a central role for research, and an interpretation of Palladio in his time, always seen in his political, social, and economic context. To symbolize this latter aspect, at the opening of the museum, we planted a mulberry tree in the courtyard of Palazzo Barbaran. Now it's better, fortunately, better condition today. And we wanted to remind people that the 16th century Vicenza was the most dynamic area in Europe for silk production. Mulberry trees were grown around the villas to nourish the silkworm that made the silk. And the noble families who produced and traded silk throughout Europe wanted contemporary architecture for their city, which broke with the invecchiata usanza, Palladio quote, the old fashioned custom of raising building clad in colorful marble and precious stones worked in the traditional Venetian style. Palladio responded with wide buildings made of low cost materials that imitated expensive stone and reduced its use to a minimum. The mulberry tree in the courtyard of the Palladio Museum announced that Palladio's story is not the story of an isolated genius, but of a community that took up the challenge of changing their city and their world. This then is the concept of the Palladio Museum, which the architect Alessandro Scandurra elaborated in his graphic design and ex exhibition layout. As you, can saw, as you can see in the museum, Scandurra first of all showcased the building itself, the Palazzo Barbarano, one of the few original works in the museum. He didn't want to change the space of the room and so all the exhibit supports are set on the floor or hung on the walls and can be removed, allow, allowing the contents to be easily changed. The cases and support are made of raw wood as if they were a flexible backstage. None of the exhibit, exhibits, models, photographs and objects are displayed, but rather they are classified and archived. They are not works of art, but as objects for study. Often, new information is added to object. Color palette placed in front of, of the models tell us, for example, about the, material you, the materials used to construct the building. Even the Palazzo Barbarano itself is annotated with caption that hang from significant points of the building to attract our attention to them. Palladian scholars appear on the wall as spirits of the palace and describe the contents of the room on tables full of models, objects, and description like the tables in their studies. The rooms of the museums are like, are like windows into their research into Palladio. In its 10 years of life, the Palladio Museums has proved to be a wonderfully versatile machine, allowing us to modify the rooms to show the latest research results. But I want also to say that the museum has influenced the way the Palladio Center works and has generated new energy. For example, it has inspired, this is the fantastic, Franco Barbieri on the wall. For example, it has inspired us to get much more involved with contemporary photography. On opening the museum 10 years ago, we staged an exhibition by the American photographer Max Belcher, who had documented the tacit memory of Palladio among the freed American slaves who, in the mid 19th century, had returned to Africa where they built from memory the mansions of their former master using local materials. The Afro-Americans abandoned the circular plan type of, of, the, of the native dwellings and built houses with rectangular plans, pediments, and front and rear porches, typical of the neo-Palladian mansions 
on American plantations. They have been other there have been other exhibitions on contemporary photography, such as, as the shown of, by Filippo Romano on the American Palladian, or this by Stefano Graziani, documents on Raphael, that involve also the, the Sol Museum as partner. All this has led us to consider the museum's relationship with today's architecture. The Palladium Museum is not a mausoleum for a dead hero. It's a place in which thinking about architecture is fostered. In our age, when the present evolves so rapidly before our very eyes, the study of the history of architecture of the distant past has perhaps never been so indispensable to try to give a critical dimension to the present. The problem is understanding how to do this. Clearly, the past can only be studied through a historical approach. We have to work on the architecture of the distant past without modernizing it, and even less without suggesting it as a formal model for today. We have to explore the past using the tools of accurate historical reconstruction with a special care being taken over context, which is indispensable in trying to understand a world that is distant and faded. However, I think we could explore the origins of themes and concepts also found in the architecture of today by describing and discussing them with the view to creating a cultural platform for the architecture of tomorrow. Palladio invented ways of communicating architecture through an exciting new medium, the book. The book for Palladio was exactly what is for us the, the iPhone completely new way of communicating and transforming. Analyzing how Palladio did it, both in terms of graphic techniques and of the concept of his Quattro Libri, provide us with a distant point as we experience and try to grasp today's revolution in digital representation of architecture. The same could be said about how villas transformed the 16th century Veneto countryside, that amazing political, administrative, architectural, infrastructural, and landscape development still has much to tell us today. So what next? What in the store in the coming decade? In terms of contents, we would like to bring to museum new studies on the economic context of Palladio's architecture that we are currently pursuing. A recent research project led by a member of our academic committee, Deb Professor Deborah Howard from St. John's College in Cambridge, has revealed that there were production facilities in many Palladian villas, a silk mill at Villa Emo, a wool mill in Villa Barbaro, a rice husking plants at Villa Pisani at Bagnolo, and so on. In fact, more generally, the Veneto of villas was also the Veneto of early factories. Fundries, saw mills, and silk, wool, and paper mills. The key factor was the fast flowing river water that powered the wheels of the mills, as well as a technological ferment that generated machinery to make the most of the water's driving power. In 1474, the first law on patents, brevetti or privilege in Italian, was approved in Venice. The boom of the number of patents or privileges granted in the second half of the 16th century suggests a previously unrecognized proto-industrial revolution. An exhibit on the subject will open next November this year at the Palladio Museum, and some of the visual materials produced for the exhibition, models, videos, and drawings, will be included permanently in the museum. Still on the subject of the museum contest, we also like to develop a series of exhibitions about architectural drawings. The first that opened in April 2023, next year, is about Raphael as architect. 
This will be followed by shown featuring Guarini, Guarino Guarini drawings in 2024 and Francesco Di Giorgio probably in 2025 and so on. In terms of being involved with the local area, the museum has turned its attention to the new communities of more or less stable residents in Vicenza. We can distinguish different categories of these new Vicentines, American families on the large military base in the city, 14,000 American out of a total population of Vicenza on 100,000, families in the suburbs, mainly not the EU in commerce, and families from other parts of Italy attracted to Vicenza by job opportunities in local companies, school, healthcare, and so on. Few cities have such a strong bond with an architect as the Vicenza of Andrea Palladio. This made Vicenza itself a particularly effective place to work on the architectural heritage as a tool of inclusion and identity for the new Vicentines. Moreover, Palladio's architecture has a familiar feel for people from many different countries, since it inspired the design of government buildings in various continents. We are currently organizing activities for these communities. For example, a program called Decolonizing Palladio is addressed to the American community, military based, not, but we are very... And it will provide guided tours to the museum according to an unconventional narrative that describes classical architecture as an usanza nuova, a new approach, to quote Palladio, in the context of innovation in Renaissance Vicenza. The narrative that will be developed in the museum rooms it is meant to encourage visitors to go and see the other Palladian masterpieces in the city with fresh eyes, free of the view that only sees classical language in terms of traditionalism and conservative choices. Along with the Byzantine residents and Italian immigrants' families living in the suburbs, we have devised a program called Breaking Down Walls with Palladio, operating directly in the communities outside the city center, the Palladio Museum will reach out to involve children and young people and their families in playful education activities by introducing them to the culture of architecture in the broader sense, from art to architectural design, town planning, and garden and landscape design. We hope to make a contribution to civil education and social inclusion. Lastly, a program with the working title Performing Palladio involves bringing high school students into the museum and enlarging them in the creative activity of translating the museum content into the languages of both the traditional performing arts, drama, music, or dance, and the social media most used by the new generation. The idea is for students to describe Palladio's architecture and the city to their peers and their parents' generation, not by emulating museum guides and educators, but in original form and in languages more congenial, congenial to them. I look forward to seeing you all again in 10 years' time and to hearing your comments on the results of our work. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Guido for his uh, very interesting, forward-looking, uh, enthusiasm-generating <laughs> <laughs> uh, contribution to, to our proceedings. And to thank again everyone who's spoken and open, open a discussion, questions, observations, advice, <laughs> ideas. Thank you also for this very engaging talks, I must say, to the two of you. Uh, I do have a question for, uh, actually for any of the speakers, anyone who's waiting to answer. And uh, it has to do uh, with the topic and the aspect of uh, authorship that I uh, would say is uh, crucial to each uh, of the museums so, yeah. we are working on, we are both working on. I was thinking also why the film was a little starting that 
revolutionary moment in architectural and historiography that pushed forward and his uh, interest uh, for, uh, you say, the, the people of real life with uh, architecture. Uh, but I was thinking about uh, the increasing interest that uh, uh, I and historiography has had in the <coughs> years uh, for uh, expanding the definition uh, for the idea of architecture as a uh, collective uh, enterprise, uh, as a shared mm. effort. So I was wondering uh, whether you think that uh, representing uh, also this collective uh, dimension of uh, architectural practice uh, is uh, possible in a uh, museum. So well, I think I would like to. I do think it's clear that, you know, especially in the architectural profession, there is a greater interest today in networked authorship and shared authorship, etc. And it's true that, you know, representing, you know, I think it's, it's always a tension between the fact that there is no architect who doesn't employ people, work in networks, etc. So we do have now to represent that. It's pretty clear, for example, you take Chandigarh. Chandigarh, you have not only Pierre Jeanneret, but Jane Drew and many others, Novicki, etc. You take La Tourette, you have Tenakis, you have Perriand in a number. So you have to represent this network, which extends, actually, even Perriand had some authors. So, so you have to represent that. But I would be, at the same time, you know, the very often, you know, Palladio, uh, I was struck this morning by the fact that Palladio sent teams to work, for example, on this commission, that commission. Mission. So the architect is also very often he authors he authors the network in many cases. So that's also something that is interesting to you know how how does he cast you know the, the people for the play is also something we have to represent. But it's a good remark. I think it's a, it's a new stage in understanding authorship in architecture. Are there other reactions to? Oh, could I, could I just uh, add add on to what? Antoine said, um, with one of the things that's fascinating about Sohn is that he liked to document the stages in a building so that we have, um, with the Bank of England, uh, about a thousand drawings, and, uh, or with Dulwich Picture Gallery, which is the first freestanding picture gallery in, in England. Um, drawings that show the creation of the walls, the scaffolding, the vaults, and his interest in technology, specially created uh, bricks which were hollow in the center, which seemed to be more resistant to fire and also lighter for creating domes, things like that. Um, but um, I think, he, interestingly enough, he wasn't a very good draftsman. Everyone said that. So he valued people like Joseph Michael Gandhi, who was not a very good architect, but was a brilliant watercolorist. And so they had a kind of symbiotic relationship. And I think sometimes with works such as the ones that I showed of the Masonic Lodge or the courts, the law courts in Westminster, which people didn't like. They said they were too dark. With Gandhi, they looked like they're flooded with light. And so, in a way, it's a kind of propaganda for, uh, for mm. Sohn. But clearly, if you have someone who is working at the Bank of England on a site that's the equivalent of St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, you've got lots of people there. But also, he's working elsewhere in the city in private houses. Um, it, it really has to be practically a military uh, organization, but, and he was very solicitous of these people, even though they don't necessarily get uh, credit for it. And for, I, I think that also for, for Palladio is especially interesting, this collection, connection between architect and patrons. Mm -hmm. Because if we walk out of the, this Palazzo, there is Palazzo Porto, and the the owner and the son of the owner are on the top of the building welcoming us, dressed as ancient Romans. Mm -hmm. So this idea of pride of, as part of a new architecture. 
So this authorship is also about the relation between patron and architect, I think. And in, very, in Palladio, it's, it's very interesting also because it was a, a small note in, in Howard catalog in, in 1975 that start this idea of, uh, of this, this new Vicenza with companies, the silk trade, because in the past, the, the old idea of Palladio was that the Palladio patrons were landowners, very lazy, then live in these classical buildings. And Howard demonstrated, no, they are not there. Uh, they entrepreneur merchants. Yeah. They, and they wanted contemporary architecture, something completely different from the traditional Venetian, the Imbecchiato Usanza, as Palladio said. Yeah. So this connection is very important, I think. There is a question. Uh, yeah, Kent from Copenhagen. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and I just uh, uh, first want to thank for Three wonderful presentations. Uh, it's really, it has really been inspiring. Uh, one of the things that's, of course, unite them is that they represent institutions that are working with one person or one big architect, uh, historical even. And I wondered, I, I think I have two questions. One is, what is the big difference between working with one person, uh, one artist, architect, and working with kind of the entire history of architecture. So for instance, like La Cité de l'Architecture in France or other places around the world, we have kind of national museums. Maybe you could elaborate a little on that. And you partly maybe led us on the direction because it was interesting to hear about how you are both here in the Palladio, but also in, in, uh, in the Corbusier and, and uh, the Zones, moving towards a higher degree of contextualization apparently, politically, fine, uh, economically, uh, societal-wise in general. And is that what we are going to see more of in order to kind of make those dead people relevant uh, and mm. they are relevant today? Yeah. I, I would say probably, but this is linked to the evolution of history of architecture, you know, at the time of the aggregate group around the young Turks of the history of architecture, etc. I think individuals are actually a they. <laughs> uh, they are groups. They're, what you said about client is also true in the case of Le Corbusier. You don't understand you know, what he did in Ahmedabad if you don't take into account the mills owner people and you know, their strategies in the context of, of independent India, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think what, when you're working on an architect, I think one of the challenges today is to find the right balance between still what is unique to the inspiration of Le Corbusier building has still some unique features, but what is actually completely collective, the work yeah. of networks, etc. So you, you, it goes back to the authorship question. I think when you have to deal with the entire history of architecture, it's probably an even more difficult question because what is the sense you give, you know, this is the big question these days with the so-called global architecture. What is the sense, uh, what is the meaning you can give to something that can go from pagoda to modern architecture, etc.? So I, I, think, I think the chance when you work on, with one individual is that in a way you're situated somewhere. So you can really dig into a specific context, et cetera, and it's easier to, uh, in some ways, do that. I think when you deal with global, it's, uh, it's quite a challenge these days, especially since global has expanded beyond what we used to call global architecture even uh, 20 years ago. Um, I, I think, um, as Antoine said, working with one architect as a kind of center point is much easier. Um, but what we have to do, I think, is, you know, they say a shark, if it doesn't move forward, it dies. And I think we have to constantly reinvent and reinterpret, um, particularly for generations that, you know, have, are, are um, digital natives as opposed to most of us who are sort of occasional visitors or day visitors to, to this world. And, um, one of the things that uh, we, we insist upon is introducing architecture to young people. We have also a youth panel, which will take 
what we're doing in terms of our program of exhibitions or even education sometimes, and they will have their own interpretation of it, and they'll have an evening in which people can come and see what they're doing. And it's, it's a way of, uh, of engaging people. And uh, as I said earlier, um, when schools are focused so much upon you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, but not on the arts of STEM, as they say in, in the English-speaking world, um, you know, science, technology, engineering, and whatever M stands for, I can't remember. But uh, we have to put the art in it to make it STEAM instead of STEM. And I think this is um, certainly going to be a you know, even more. And this is also where the internet helps. Um, during the lockdown, we um, have <coughs> once a year, we have a, a drawing contest where people from all over the world are invited to submit drawings, which can either be hand drawings or um, digital or mix or a hybrid mixture of the two. And uh, we do this with the World Architecture Federation. Pre-COVID, we had it um, in the building, and a limited number of people could see it. But uh, in 2021, we did it online. And so people from Singapore to um, New York to San Diego could all at the same time be part of the presentation. And also, we draw in people from all over the world. And this is you know, a way of, of validating um, the importance of drawing, which Sohn talks about, and which is obviously central to architecture. And also, particularly in an age in which the computer has tended to replace the hand as a way in which people uh, create buildings. You really think of someone like Zaha Hadid. I sometimes think if she didn't have a computer, she wouldn't have had anything to say. And I think that um, it's important to be able to reinstate the hand as, as an important part of this. She was a great draft person. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't yeah. know it. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I would say Zaha, she had then Schumacher. But you know, she, she, she did come from drawing. Oh, sure. But then. Yeah, recently, we visited an exhibition at La Cité des Sciences et la Villette. And uh, I, I have asked to the, 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 the woman who did the exhibition, but uh, in which way did you, are you able to know if people are learning something? It, it was about industry. And she said, well, you know, it's not a problem anymore, even for uh, a public institution. The question was to have to, uh, kind of an experience. And so I wonder if well, architecture is maybe more difficult than anything, because it's about imagination, it's about and, and this kind of experience, ambience, that means that you shouldn't do anything, you should be very, and I wonder, you know, for such a difficult and complicated issue like architecture, um, how you can explain people what is architecture without trying to learn, to help them to learn something. That's, so I think it's a kind of an issue because um, people are less, or uh, like, uh, in France, less and less, I think, interested by architecture, unfortunately. Hmm. This is true. Because to understand architecture, you also the drawings of architecture is a technical drawing. It's not yes, easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Now it's changing because now with the 3D, the, the virtual reality we can have. But traditionally, the, the language of architecture was not easy to understand for the not architecture people. I think it does raise a fundamental question for sure, which is the relation between knowledge and experience. Because it's true that, Absolutely, you know, from zone yes. to et cetera, you know, we want people to experience something. Yeah. And part of architecture is actually the experience of architecture. Yeah. But then can you, past a certain moment, a museum, I'm still attached to the fact that, yes, there is knowledge at some point to gain. And actually it would be good that people, and I think in the Palladio, just like so, you, you yeah. learn something yeah. also. Yeah. So Absolutely, how do we yes. articulate Yes. And I was really super interested in the way yeah. you presented the Palladio Museum in articulation mm -hmm. to research. I think yeah. the relation mm -hmm. to research is fundamental, yeah. but how do we re-articulate today experience and research? Yeah. It's not a simple question. Yeah. No, this is true. The, uh, because our museum are only interface between the people and the real building. Absolutely. This is, this, this is the problem. Yeah. 
you for the presentation. I just would like uh, to uh, ask uh, which are the expectations? You presented your perspective, but uh, which uh, are the expectations you confront with uh, from uh, government mm -hmm. and uh, from the public? You mentioned before the new digital native, uh, uh, you spoke of the educational programs that you had. But uh, which are the expectations of the public that is coming to this uh, very specific uh, architectural museum? Um, is uh, the environmental uh, concern also touching this public? Uh, and yeah. how, just an example from your point of view, which is a very specific one, are you able to address that? Or are, is the public coming to you already expecting something uh, different? Uh, uh, related to the specific uh, character of your uh, institution. And is it uh, the same for the government that in some cases funding you directly or indirectly? Um, if I could uh, start off on, on that. Um, I think as with any museum, um, there's no uh, uniformity of approach. We have people who come who know nothing about Sone, uh, people who come who think that we're an outpost of the British Museum, uh, and then people who come who are interior decorators or architects or students of architecture. So in a way, it's an experience. You're, it's an immersive experience. So people respond to the fact that what Sone wanted to create always with architecture was something that wasn't neutral. It was a kind of mood journey. You go from large rooms to small rooms, dark rooms to light rooms, uh, the different colored lights, etc. Uh, and people respond to this on whatever level they're, uh, mm. they're able to. But the other thing that we notice is that I would say probably 75% of our visitors look at our website before they come. So they have some idea of what we're doing. Uh, and I think this is only going to grow in, in the future. But it is a problem with a public that doesn't know about architecture. What you can hope to do is make them think about architecture and see that they're invested in the, the built environment. And I would slightly disagree that I think probably architecture is something that is a lively topic, because people immediately have uh, opinions about new architecture, whether they like it or whether they don't like it. And uh, again, it's, it's like contemporary art. You know, it, there's an immediate response. And I think Palladio said that you don't really have to understand uh, architecture in order to go into a, muse a, a room and feel that it's well proportioned or not. He likened it to hearing a choir sing. And you knew if they're singing flat or if they weren't singing flat. So I think this is something that's in to us. Well, Guido, would you like to no, the, comment on, on this for, question? For the, for the Palladio Museum, is a specific situation, I think, because all the Palladio buildings are in the area radius of 50 kilometers from, from Vicenza. So we have a huge heritage of building all around us. And our action is must be to create a culture to preserve this building for the future. So uh, all the programs of education are, are developed by Ilaria Bondandolo, our head of research, sit there. And this is one of the most important part of the museum because if only if we educated the Byzantine by the traditional, the new Byzantine, and because in a city like this, Palladio is a name. Everybody knows about Palladio, but nobody really knows Palladio buildings. M many people from Vicenza never, never went to the Teatro Olimpico, for instance. No? And so in our case, our mandate is really strictly connected with an area and an heritage different from Le Corbusier, for instance, which the so buildings would well, fit into that. Uh, you know, they're celebrating uh, Le Corbusier's birthday officially in Chandigarh. Really? <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Chandigarh would be strangely uh, in the good. place. Yeah. 
I would probably add something, which is, you know, I was really struck this summer by how popular is the visit of the Perret apartment in Le Havre. Really? And, and you know, it's extremely, you know, you have people, and frankly, there was not the usual crowd of architects, really, <laughs> the public at large, yeah. uh, yeah. with even people pretending to know architecture and evidently not, which was quite fun. Uh, <laughs> so I think, and people were attracted, what you said, you know, the experience, you know, for example, because it's an apartment in which you can project yourself, so there is a, the, the, the children's room, a bedroom, etc., etc. So I do think part of architecture is really hard to make people understand. They don't read plan. Mm. But another part of it where they can project their own use of space, etc., is more accessible. And we have probably to find the key to navigate these two things. Uh, yeah, what, what, what? Hmm? Please. Furniture. Yeah, furniture mm. it might be key, too. Could I just add something to uh, Bruce? You, you asked about uh, government expectations. and. We are the smallest national museum in the UK. Um, we're a national museum partly because of the Act of Parliament, but also because the government recognizes that the building, the contents, are of national and international importance. Um, so we get a grant from the government every year. But with that, um, we also have to give them what they call KPIs, which are key performance indicators. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so they are interested in knowing you know, the, the number of people who visit, uh, how many are from abroad, the number of children under the age of 16 who come, uh, all these sorts of things. Uh, and we give them to them every year. And they never comment on them. I think they probably are filed away and forgotten about. I'm afraid if I asked the government, why they don't respond, they probably will respond. But <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. No, don't do it. Question about the here in Microphone is arriving. OK, thank you. A question for Anne Hemi. About the Courboisier Museum, you're obviously early in the planning stages, what, will, will you have, will you use one of his designs or will you ask an architect to design in his kind of style? Uh, it's, uh, how, will you, how will you cope with that? A couple of things. Uh, first, we will not use one of his design because using a design of, you know, Le Corbusier is actually a very contextual architect. You mm -hmm. may believe it or not, but actually even if he did use sometimes similar solution in different places, you know, it's actually very striking how context matters. There was actually a huge debate a few years ago because Chandigarh wanted to build the Museum of, of Human Knowledge that was never built. Uh, and with a strange idea to use the version, which was actually the palace of the governor. So that was a very weird idea, which was fortunately abandoned. So no, not a building uh, uh, based on the composite drawing, which in addition would create a conundrum in terms of authenticity, etc. This is precisely what we don't want to encourage. Uh, second, a building by an architect, but an architect who would not try to make his point uh, uh, against Le Corbusier, which mm. is difficult. In other words, would be more, you know, would be more interested in Lacaton and Vassal kind of, you know, attitude toward architecture than, you know, a grand gesture. You know, a grand gesture next to Le Corbusier is problematic. Uh, you know, there, there is the case in Ronchamp of what Piano did. Uh, there, there have been a couple of painful experiences of people trying to confront mm. themselves. I think the difficulty, you know, Sohn is, you're so lucky, he did it by himself. <laughs> <laughs> but in our case, you know, it would be to find an architect with a certain degree of modesty, which, as we know, is the most difficult quality to find among architects. <laughs> Any other points in, in relation yeah. to this, this theme? Hi, and thank you for the presentations. Um, especially as we keep hearing that nobody reads uh, books of architecture, or books in general. 
Um, do you think, uh, I haven't seen any data, but I assume it must be correct. Uh, do you think exhibition can provi provide a, a, a new, uh, more accessible uh, communication media? And uh, in addition to that, how do you think the, the outputs of your uh, museums will change? So what's uh, a catalog, uh, an exhibition catalog in the 21st century? What's, uh, to whom mm. is it dedicated? Is it for scholars? Is it for mm. people who want to look at the pictures? Uh, so that's it. We do. Now, this is a fantastic question because the, the problem is that usually the catalog is not about the exhibition, is print before the exhibition. And the very good idea of Mirko when he was the director of the CCA was to create this, this book called Afterwards, something like this. It's a publication after the exhibition with the, the photos of the arrangement, with the comments. So it's a tale of the exhibition, different from the contents of the catalog. And this, I think, was a very, very good idea, I remember. <laughs> they did only one, and they stopped. But, but uh, yeah. But the dimension of the exhibition is difficult to have in in the in the catalog, unfortunately. I do think there is a tendency in contemporary culture, linked to the digital, actually, to to blur author, uh, to author and to curate, and that's which has. G Good sides, but also bad sides. Bad sides, yeah. That's to say there is a tendency to sample, for example, to, uh, et cetera. So I think, uh, yes, exhibitions are becoming, whether we like it or not, very often the privileged medium, but it has also dangers. Yeah. Because there is, you know, I still believe that despite the fact there are more authors these days than readers, it's still <laughs> good to write books. Uh, but, it, but it's true that exhibition curating more generally has become yeah. you know, a major yeah. cultural uh, thing. Yeah, Antoine, because the exhibition is a new media in a certain sense. It's, also, mm -hmm. yes, it's, it's an experience. Mm -hmm. it, it's not only exactly. knowledge. Yeah, so, and I, I think that this is a problem. And there is not a way to... It's a very good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, what uh, we've been discussing in the last minutes really is what, what are the circumstances or the interventions which lead to good architecture? And obviously a situation like that of Palladio, which led to good architecture, that is a highly educated upper class with a lot of money who want to assert their position in the world when some of their power has been taken away from them by the Venetians who, who govern Vicenza. They, they are not any longer a, mm, a ruling class yeah, in the yeah, real, yeah. real sense. They're, they're a powerful class. And you can't, uh, you can't really today see a way of <laughs> translating into modern society a setup like the one that existed in Palladio's time, where there's a city where people see each other, each other every day in, in, in the piazza, where the, sc the scale is small, where uh, communication is inter interpersonal and so on. And that underlines and uh, focuses on the responsibility of cultural institutions, of museums, who can communicate directly or indirectly through a television program or whatever it may be with, with, with a wider public to reinforce cultural, reinf reinforce knowledge and appreciation. I, yes, I, th I think it, that's a very good point. And, Again, I would just go back to the fact that we have to deal with not just one public, but different types of public. People who come prepared, people who come unprepared, people somewhere in between. Uh, just as you know, when we communicate with the public, there's some people who want uh, something in the post, you know, something that they can hold in their hands. Other people, uh, it's emailed, and you probably, those of you who have uh, 
children probably realize that they don't read emails anymore. You have to send them a text message. So all of these, we have to deal in a variety of different ways. And the, the exhibition and the book of the exhibition are uh, addressed to often to, to two different uh, groups of people, ones who experience it and the others who see it as the book of the exhibition. But I think the idea of the afterwards is, uh, is very good. I remember Ulrich Middeldorf, who was a, a German art historian who was the director of the um, German Institute in Florence, the Art History Institute in Florence, uh, once said that the best time to do an exhibition catalog was after the exhibition was over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think that's yeah, true. This is true. Yes, it's true. It's true. A lot of things. It's usually after it's done that it would be time to get to it. <laughs> okay. We. I think we have to. Well, uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers, all the listeners, and all the people who have raised issues and questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, the conversation this afternoon will be a little bit different because uh, we have uh, three institutions that um, have a, a quite a different mandate in respect uh, to the one uh, of this uh, morning. And uh, both uh, uh, Kent, uh, um, Trin, uh, and, uh, mm, uh, sorry, Kiran uh, will uh, briefly introduce the specific character of their institution so that is much more understandable than the answer, the strategies, and the policies that they put in place according to the different constrictions. But I would like to start uh, from uh, a general um, a description, a personal description of uh, the situation in which uh, uh, we are today, let's say, the context. And um, 2022 is uh, more, almost more than two years that uh, uh, we have been through this uh, uh, COVID uh, emergency situation, this uh, pandemic that has affected uh, at least until January this year, almost all the countries in the world except two, very small, by the way. This uh, uh, situation, to this situation, we have to add then, at least in the case of Europe, a, a war which is uh, uh, adding a, a new kind uh, of uh, perspective uh, a new kind of uh, also perception of the world in which we are. Um, how do we look at this? Uh, this uh, crisis didn't come uh, unexpected. In a certain way, all the crises uh, can be predicted. Uh, we do not do that because generally we are um, busy or interested in other things, other values, other problems, and we don't pay attention to the signs, to the clues that could uh, already um, suggest us uh, a possible critical situation. We can look at this situation we are today as uh, the combinations of a lot of different crises that uh, uh, we have been through in the last, uh, let's say, 50 years. Um, we didn't pay too much attention to the sign of an environmental crisis that were already recognized in the 1960s. Just to mention a starting point, uh, Reckel Carson, Silent Spring, 1962. We didn't pay attention to the uh, energy crisis, 1973 and then 1979. We thought that it was a kind of a break in a perfect system that uh, as soon as the price of oil um, that uh, in 1973 went up, uh, I describe that because it looks like today, went up for uh, political reason because of the 
countries, uh, uh, producer of oil uh, in uh, the Arab countries, producer of oil decided uh, to increase in a progressive way of 5% the cost of oil in respect to countries, Western countries, that were directly or indirectly supporting Israel in the Arab-Israel war of 1973. And the consequences of that crisis were uh, reduced uh, temperature in the houses, uh, reduced lighting in the shops, reduced lighting in the offices, um, uh, control uh, gas, gas and gasoline uh, uh, distribution, so something that more or less uh, we already saw now with the increased price of uh, energy, but uh, we are going to see also this winter the, the solution are not very, very different. There were only, there was uh, only one um, um, strategic change that was very strong, especially in Europe, that was the one uh, that uh, brought back a particular attention to the passive energy control that little by little produced uh, in Europe some laws that uh, became more and more relevant. And speaking of Italy, we now have a classification of energy performance of buildings that is, I can only say after 50 years, is the consequence of that kind of things. Uh, we didn't pay much attention to the consequences of the, let's say, military uh, security crisis that uh, was uh, going through to 1990s, 2010, but still present related to terrorism. And we didn't pay too much attention to the solution that were put in place in terms of control of public space. Some were physical. Mm, barriers that more or less architects were asked to hide uh, with uh, smart landscape moves, uh, uh, police reinforcement, but a lot of uh, video surveillance. Um, keep in mind that I think London uh, in that uh, 2007 had uh, about 7,000 cameras, and I don't know if uh, in uh, 2019, according to The Guardian, uh, they are about 700,000, which is nothing in comparison to the level of uh, video surveillance that uh, you have uh, in Chinese city, among the most controlled cities in the world, uh, the 10 most controlled, eight are Chinese. Uh, those uh, decisions affected our public space and our life in a very evident way already. We didn't pay too much attention to the consequences of the crisis 2008, the financial crisis, the bubble, the financial and the real estate bubble, and that revealed already social inequities, and especially in North America was making very, very clear the kind of dramatic situation in the access to basic, basic uh, situation like the house. Uh, we didn't pay too much attention to the, how can I say, the SARS and the MERS, uh, 2002, 2012, uh, that already anticipated uh, the, the COVID, uh, the COVID uh, uh, crisis. And we do that because generally we try to negate as much as possible this uh, critical situation, trying to continue as soon as uh, as soon as this critical situation disappears, to go back to the old habit. And the oil crisis of the 70s is an example, clear example of that. So we try to negate that, to postpone the solution. And uh, in the best case, we try to, we are forced to use tools, concepts, and instruments that are already available. Crises do not produce immediately new paradigm, new strategies, new instruments. You reuse what you have. So, but it's clearly in this context, uh, I feel that uh, um, what uh, could be the reaction uh, of uh, institutions that are dealing with our environment, our architecture, production, 
uh, our infrastructure situation that are deeply affected by these kind of things, which are the expectation, as I asked this morning, from the public, from government, but which are the responsibility the institution they want to take. It seems to me, and I give you a list, that uh, these uh, themes, I'm trying to find the paper that uh, I printed, uh, these uh, themes are already at the center of a lot of reflection. I took uh, the September list of architectural events in the world, and I selected uh, some of them. Energy and the solar show, edible, that is Stalin, I think. Uh, making now the new unknown, a world for feminist democracy, design futures, Habitar al Margen, urban challenges, mission neighborhood, it is about time, the city has a common good, seed of resilience. So you already, already see that the landscape is totally different. But the point is not to incorporate in architectural discourse this kind of uh, themes. This could become, um, the architects, they are already trying that. They uh, is becoming a kind of architecture of good intention. If you go around, uh, no architect today will be against uh, sustainable environment. They were, some of them, against this world till a few years ago. They are not, again, about uh, a social uh, justice. They are not against, uh, by the way, these are the values that they propose. And they are telling us that they have the solution. So I doubt about that. But uh, my point is, uh, which kind of critical discourse? How this, uh, the institution can play a role in a situation in which universities very often uh, are um, are changing a little bit, but very often had a total different perspective about the value of knowledge and the production of knowledge, in which the debate on the public arena is non-existing except on social media, uh, how a critical discussion can be developed by this institution and what this institution want to take uh, uh, as part of their uh, responsibility, uh, as part of their mandate. So um, I think that um, I would like uh, to, to, to leave uh, the, the stage uh, to Kieran Long, uh, coming from Stockholm. He will introduce us uh, to the specific situation there, which has some interest for us Italians, as Italians. In, f in fact, um, because uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, political shift also that has been already in Sweden that is very similar to what is happening in Italy. So there is also this kind of component that has to be taken in account. Kiran Long. Thanks, Mirko. Thanks so much to the Palladio Museum for this event. What a pleasure it is to be here and um, Guido, to hear you talk about this place, the Palladio Museum, as a cultural platform for the architecture of tomorrow is so inspiring. It's something we'll take back. It feels like that. It's a wonderful achievement. Great to be here. And also wonderful to be introduced by Mirko, who's somebody who always reminds us of the biggest possible context for our work, um, the intimidatingly large context for our work. So we'll, I'll try to talk about some of those and the way my institution, Arkdes, um, the National Center for Architecture and Design in Sweden, the way that we try to at least be a place where some of these challenges can, can be opened up. Um, and we'll get into that. As you said, Mirko, compared to the three wonderful presentations we heard this morning, fascinating. It feels like the context of my work and our work at ArcDes is quite different in the sense that it's enmeshed in the everyday contemporary political debate both in Sweden, about culture, and about architecture and design. And we are an, a national institution, a state institution, charged with engaging in both of those debates, often at the same time, with very different expectations from different parts of the public and different parts of the professional 
contexts and different, different parts of politics. But what we basically are is a museum with a very large collection, four million objects of the whole history of modern Swedish architecture um, between about 1850 and the present day, but focused on the sort of middle decades of the 20th century. And we have two large exhibition spaces where we show a permanent, um, a permanent display of the history of Swedish architecture, which we will soon change, and I'll come to that too, and a, a quite vibrant temporary exhibition program. And I'm going to show you, rather than showing you what our museum is and what our future strategy is, I thought I'd take you through two projects, two exhibition projects, which reflect these two, this twin role that Arctis has and that I know in different ways the three of us share. The question to be a great cultural institution, a visitor attraction, a place that does all the things a museum does, and a place also, an agency, that can contribute to national scale debates about the future of Swedish cities in an instrumental, direct way. Um, and I'll tell you a bit, this, through these projects, I thought it would be more interesting for you to see, you may see radical contrasts in these projects, or you may see some commonalities, and those are things we can talk about. When I arrived in 2017 in Stockholm, this double mission was seen as a big problem by lots of people. How can you be a cultural institution that also is instrumentalized by the government to decide how cities should be? That doesn't work. A cultural institution is about openness and imagination and, and the unpredictable futures of, that come out of an encounter with a collection or an exhibition, whereas a sort of policy center is about forming uh, a kind of, yeah, a future in a very concrete way together with the various layers of the bureaucracy in Sweden. And, but we're, we're moving in both those territories and I think they feed one another and increasingly make sense to me as a big possibility for architecture and design museums. And I believe that institutions like ours, precisely as I think you tried to say, Guido, have this huge opportunity that art museums do not have to, to uh, be involved in a policy debate without losing our identity as cultural institutions. Um, we work with a theme, this, when I arrived in Stockholm, I, I had said this is the kind of museum we're going to be. We're going to be a museum of design and public life. It turns out that that's impossible to translate into Swedish. This has been an ongoing, now I speak Swedish, when I moved there I didn't. Um, public, in English of course, has this connotation of, of both the public and us all together in the public realm, but something public also connotes, if not exactly public ownership, a kind of collective responsibility to something. That's really hard to translate in Swedish because they have the word offentlik, which means public sector, really, like it's the public sector, it's the government or the state that owns it. And this kind of word for civic or public, that realm is very hard to, to describe. So we keep using this in English, even though every, everything else we do is in Swedish. Well, my, my idea about, and, when, and the word design also needs a bit of glossing. When I talk about design, I talk about it in the Anglo-Saxon way as a very general category that includes architecture and many other disciplines um, and many other kinds of creativity that contribute um, to, to the city. So putting the, and, and it gives us the room, of course, at Arctis to think of design very broadly. We're an institution with a collection of architecture, but with a mission to also make exhibitions and programs about design. And we define that for, as, as everything from digital interfaces and social media and video games to infrastructure and urban planning and, and everything in between. We give ourselves the freedom. But we don't do fashion and we don't really do interiors. And there are certain things which seem to me to be not, if not exactly excluded, but we tend away from with this kind of definition. There are, of course, other institutions in Sweden that cover those fields very well. I started this kind of idea of design and public life really at the Victoria and Albert Museum, where I was before, um, before Arcdes, with especially with two colleagues of mine at the time, Rory Hyde and Karina Gardner, where we talked a lot about the way the V&A, as a very large museum, is a kind of condensation of the city. It is, in fact, when, when you think of the v and many people will have a picture in their mind of very fine objects in very fine rooms, presented beautifully, wonderfully researched somewhere, but, the, but what you really experience is, is, is these rooms full of objects. And in fact, when you work there, you realize the v and is, is that, but it's also a cafe and a shop and a public space and a paddling pool and a school and a university and a research operation and a science laboratory and almost and a library, of course, and many other things that are the full spectrum of what a city can offer. 
a public toilet. The v is a really important public toilet on that particular corner of South Kensington. There are no other public toilets unless you walk all the way up to the Science Museum or across the road to the Natural History Museum. So, and our toilets were right by the door. So in fact, that function as a public toilet was rather important for the v in a weird way. And so if you think of that, everything from David Cameron meeting Xi Jinping in our exhibition of Chinese paintings, having their summit there at the museum, to being a public toilet. The v and in an institution like that, a large museum, or maybe any museum, embraces a uniquely broad spectrum of public space in the city, and that's what's wonderful about them. There's a huge possibility there. So it's partly a polemic about public space, design of public life. What kind of public space is a museum? Every kind, it turns out. It's also a kind of way of understanding what our agency or how we define design in relation to citizenship today. And in this, we were very influenced both at the V&A and later by anthropology, the field of anthropology, where design can broadly be thought of as a kind of imagination that changes the city. It might create a new ritual or a new kind of exchange between us. It might, create, it might be the creativity of being a good mother or hosting a good dinner party. But of course, there are professional groups who are deeply engaged with, with this, and those are architects and urban designers and planners and many others. But that kind of creativity it takes to change the city is what we're trying to be focused on. Come back to that in some examples. Um, and then just lastly, because we talked about it at breakfast this morning, and it feels like strange to not mention the extreme political changes that are underway in many of our countries right now, this one and my own, Sweden, my new country. I'm a Swedish citizen now, I have to get used to it. My colleagues keep saying, don't say you, say us. I've got to learn to say us about Sweden. Um, but yeah, a, a big political shift to the right has happened in Sweden, which has been going on for some years now. But of course, um, in the most recent election, the Swedish Democrats, a party with, with roots in racist politics, are now the second largest uh, party in parliament in Sweden. What that means and the unpacking of that is going to take a long time, but as a state institution, it directly affects us, not because they can change or order us to do certain things, but because it says something about the tone of voice of this notion of public life in Sweden right now. And if I were to leave with one final sort of general abstraction before getting into the projects, we're now starting to work in the, in the museum with the notion that museums can be a kind of machine of depolarization. What's wonderful about the state of a visit to a museum, the, your state of attention, is a kind of openness and acceptance to the objects and stories you are told in them. And if we instrumentalize that too much in one direction politically, without allowing the space for any of the broad spectrum of, of views in Sweden to, to find a place in an institution like ours, we're a national institution, remember, um, I think we're not doing our job. But perhaps this is something we can come back to in the, in the discussion. Um, we have three principles. This is a very boring sentence, which is kind of how I tell, what, tell our politicians what we do. We're a museum, we're a place of research, and we're an arena for debate. So two exhibition projects, which may look very different from one another, but reflect these two, um, this double role. The first is an exhibition that's recently closed at the museum called Sigurd Leverens, Architect of Death and Life. Um, Sigurd Leverens is a very important architect, of course, in Swedish modern history, maybe the greatest architect in Swedish history. There are some arguments about that, but um, I think he is. Um, and we made Sweden's largest ever collections-based exhibition about an, ex uh, about an architect, um, the first major monographic collections-based exhibition in, in my institution for a very, very long time. Um, we held the whole Sigurd Leverance um, archive of 13 and a half thousand drawings, including, and as well as many other objects that are not catalogued as drawings, not the scale of Le Corbusier's collection, but nearly a third, you know, a half of it, pretty big. And um, we went through that entire collection and catalogued it and photographed it. We made a very large book with about a thousand drawings in it. In the exhibition, there are 600 objects, 450 of them are drawings, 150 are furniture pieces, loans, other, other pieces, sculpture maquettes, other things that were in his, in his collection. And I can't take you, I don't have time to take you through this whole exhibition, so I'll sort of flick through. This is the um, exhibition environment. Does the, the exhibition design was made by Caruso St. John, the London-based architects, who of course themselves are, are experts on Leverance's work. This is a room dedicated to Leverance's very important work within burial and cemeteries. Um, 
which is a very large part of his career, a lifelong engagement. We did a lot of research. My colleague, Johan Ern, did a lot of research on the 1920s and 1930s, where Leverance was a commercial architect um, and working on shops and restaurants and offices and many other commercial typologies, and was a key player in the 1930 Stockholm exhibition, which was an important moment in Swedish architecture history. He was a manufacturer in the 1940s and 50s. He lived in another Swedish town, running a factory, doing industrial design and making metal components for buildings. That company was called Idesta and things for the Stockholm underground, like these kiosks and ticket kiosks. And then the, the works for which he's probably most famous internationally, these two wonderful churches he made near the end of his, uh, at the end of his career and near the end of his life of St. Mark's and St. Peter's, um, and we, where we tried to lift the role of, of art and um, craft collaborations in those buildings. A, a few short notes. I can't unpack Leverance for you too deeply now, but just to respond also to a couple of the things we heard this morning, I would gently, gently push back um, to what Howard said earlier about the difficulty of architecture always being to try to exhibit something that is not there. In my interpretation, and I don't think this is necessarily incompatible, what architects make is drawings especially in the modern period, especially in the kind of industrial, the period of industrialized construction. So if architects make drawings and then somebody else turns those drawings into buildings, we have in fact the originals in architecture collections. We are in fact looking at the works of architecture because the work of architecture is drawing. It's drawing in many forms. Drawing can mean many things now, especially in the contemporary, uh, in contemporary practice. So I have a very strong belief in the drawings. And the other thing I believe about them is that they are no more or, so this is Sigurd Leverance. I'm, I'm going to flick through some of um, to his drawings, because otherwise we're going to get stuck in the buildings. But a drawing, for example, like this one, which is a drawing by Sigurd Leverance from 1928 of a shop interior that was built and is now lost. Has much more, is much more communicative and much easier to understand for a general public than the majority of what you will find in a modern art museum. We have a neighbor who is a modern art, a uh, very uh, eminent modern art collection, modern museet, um, and the majority of the works in there are much more difficult to comprehend than this kind of twilight perspective of an interior of a shop looking very welcoming, this large scale typography on the left hand side, which is a big part of Leverance's um, ideas about um, an urban commercial architecture in this period, the role of artificial light, the role of commerce in the city, and all of that that's contained in a wonderful drawing like this one. Or a kind of filmic drawing like this, where this is a, a perspective of a design Leverance made for, a, for an experimental um, apartment for the 1930 exhibition. It was built for the exhibition, but never built in, in any reality. And you see this couple, you know, there's a woman adjusting her hair, saying, what do you think, up or down? And he's, he's saying, oh, can we just leave now? And, and, then he, and then later on, maybe in the evening, she's still getting ready, and he's sitting there having a cigarette. And, and then maybe this is them after their night out, sitting, having a drink on the sofa, or he's looking out the window, and you see her, her shawl. Just, um, so this is, a, this is a drawing with time in it. It's a drawing with a narrative in it. It's a visualization of a lifestyle and of a class and of, a, of, a, of young people you know, having pleasure in their lives and going out and doing these kinds of things. This, for me, is, um, is, is wonderful material that there's no barrier to a very large public to understand. Um, of course, there are many other kinds of drawing in the Leverance exhibition and many other kinds of drawing in, in, the, in our collection, and the majority will not be um, beautiful colored perspectives like this one of the ladies' cafe at the National Insurance um, Building. Um, but I, I really believe that, uh, and our project about Leverance has somehow proven that there is a large audience for exhibitions of architectural drawings if we scale up the ambition of our stories about them. Um, and I would, wanted to just mention the, the title again, Architect of Death and Life. Leverance was famous for churches and cemeteries. What you see in these images is the life of the commercial city. You see dancing, and you see dining, and you see gossiping, and you see the, the kind of trivial reality of being a modern citizen. And death and life, though, really cut through for us nationally. People really understood the exhibition to be about something they had a stake in, because they may not know anything about architect, but death and life, everybody knows something about that. And everybody in Sweden, especially in Stockholm, has a connection with, um, with the, large cemetery, the large cemetery he made in the south of the city. You have a direct um, connection to these kinds of thematics that helps us bring a bigger public to this um, exhibition. Um, the other project, I hope I'm not going to, you have to shout if I'm getting too, um, going too long. I wanted to show you one other exhibition which contrasts very heavily with, with Leverance. This is an exhibition I made in 2018 with my colleagues Daniel Golling, 
Murray Louise Richards called Public Luxury. Public Luxury is an exhibition about contemporary um, Swedish debates that it seemed to me were best seen through the medium of our field of architecture and design. You see them most clearly when you think about them through the lens of how the city is changing and being adapted and being influenced by different kinds of creativity. And of course it had lots of architecture and design in it and street furniture and even small public monuments and so on. But it also had video games and memes and um, citizens' campaigns about things and political protests and material from a whole range of different kinds of creativity that are very definitely affecting the future of the Swedish city. The exhibition was also a polemic about the public space of the museum. We opened temporarily this long disused entrance to the museum, which we're now going to open, um, open permanently. This was a sculptural entrance by the artist Orsi Jungnelius, who was in fact at the time designing this, um, this artwork for a Stockholm underground station. So it was both an entrance and a kind of model of her work for this, um, for this uh, new Tunnelbana station. And we made this work outside the museum on, on the public space outside. This is, a, this is called Dance Barna. It's a public dance floor where you come with your phone and you, you connect by Bluetooth to this very high quality speaker system. And you have 20 minutes for your music and you can dance there and then it kicks you off and then it's the next person's turn. Um, the people behind this are three architects who are also dancers and they make these works permanently in some places. Um, and wonderful things happen, of course, when the museum opens up in this way. And this is the, kind of the dancers we employ to, at the opening. But we had, um, we had uh, things like this happen. This we found on Instagram. We still don't know who these people are. I can tell you they are not the typical visitors to Art Des who came and they re adapted the dance floor for their kind of dancing and they brought their decks and they connected to, to, um, to those speakers. And for that moment, it happened while the museum was closed, but for that moment, Krebsholm and the island we're on in the centre of Stockholm was absolutely theirs. So creating a kind of territory through our curatorial practice that can be appropriated um, is really important to us. It was important to the exhibition. He's amazing, this guy. I think he won this competition. Um, but public luxury had many other polemics in it, polemics about the closure of spaces for home, that homeless people sleep in. It had strange, this is a very Swedish phenomenon, I think the hot dog van, um, a very important public space in lots of Swedish cities. Um, this is a guy who, who uh, is a hot dog seller in a northern Swedish town called Umeå, and the municipality decided that his hot dog hut was too ugly. It's very Swedish, it's gotta be organized. Um, we have to redesign it so it's nicer. And when they did, his his sausages got cold and he got cold and it was functionally like dysfunctional. So he, he designed this rather wonderful poster which was in the exhibition and this just means in Swedish, the sausage and the good bird, like the bloke, the guy, will be warm, should be warm. Um, and so, and I always say in Sweden, only in Sweden would you have a, you know, a hot dog guy who, who could design a, a poster that's somehow so well judged, like it's so well done, like there's something deep in Swedish culture. Um, type, typography and you know, proportion is somehow there. Um, I skip a bit forward. These were a series of memes that were in the exhibition, uh, Facebook memes by an unknown group of people campaigning in a, in a northern Swedish city that was having a lot of investment in public space but very poor quality investment. Um, so, so this is like a meme that says 2014, 2017, and this just says, yeah, that was worth spending 65 million crowns on. Like, the, you know, and rightly asking questions, but using a kind of tool or a kind of visual, um, visual language. This is another one of their memes with uh, pictures of bombed out Berlin next to their own city of Umeå. Um, this is a kind of creativity, a kind of drawing, can, we can say, that has its intention to directly affect um, the city. Oh, here he is again. I can't get enough of him. Um, Video games, uh, uh, also a kind of public space being created by design online and through, uh, through games like this one. This is an exhibit about Battlefield, the, game, the video game Battlefield. It's a game about the Second World War, um, where for the first time you could play as a woman soldier and many other things that are sort of baked into a Swedish creative culture that became really controversial internationally and online when it, when it was released. Um, we had apps like this one, which was an app connecting newly arrived Syrian refugees with Swedish citizens, um, and campaigns by disabled rights groups. I don't really have time to go into that. Um, and this one, I will just briefly, because it might be interesting for our debate. This was a political campaign about a building, very directly about a building in a small town in the south of Sweden called Herby. Herby was the first municipality controlled by the Swedish Democrats. This this coming far-right um, political party that is now the second biggest party in Sweden. But this was 2018, so they controlled this municipality. It was the only one they controlled. 
And in Herbie, there was a proposal for a little bandstand by a pretty good architect, a really good emerging architectural office in Stockholm called Hermansen Hiller Lundberg. They do great work. And it was a little bandstand and a little public toilet for a, for a park that had long had very poor facilities and you know, a modest amount of money. But the people of Herbie hated this building so much that they rose up in their hundreds and took to the streets to say, we would rather have nothing than have this building. Um, that was their slogan. We would rather have nothing at all than to have this, because it seemed to them, them that this was some sort of elite work imposed on them from Stockholm by an architect who couldn't possibly understand their context. What we didn't, couldn't have known then, but we had an intuition about, was that this kind of debate would become more and more part of the political landscape of Stockholm. Buildings and the way that buildings look are directly related to, to the rise of the, of the political right in Sweden. And the political right believes that architecture should look like it did in around 1910, they seem to have agreed on. And, and now they're in power and they have the ability to make those things happen. So a kind of pastiche um, architecture is part of their political project, but also the critical part is that the criticism of high architecture or elite architecture or contemporary architecture in general is also a part of their way of being populist and of expressing their political identity. So this was, the, we had material from the protest and we had the, the model of the architects um, in the exhibition, just side by side. Um, I'll click flick through some of this. We had wonderful works of architecture like this one. This is a dome of a proposed mosque in the north of Stockholm by, um, by Johan Selsing, one of Stockholm, Sweden's greatest living architects. Um, a, a project that was stalled because the Swedish state does not fund religious buildings. So this Somali Islamic group cannot build a, uh, a, a mosque, which is of course would be their most important public space. They still are waiting for this to be built. Um, and many other works, which I don't have time to go into now. Just lastly, if I have time, um, one of the works in, this, in that exhibition were these two things in the foreground. Um, I, I moved to Stockholm on the day of Stockholm's worst ever terrorist attack. It was a vehicle-borne terrorist attack on the main shopping street in Stockholm where somebody hijacked a truck and drove it down the street, killing six people and injuring many more. It was a traumatic moment for, for Stockholm. But what Stockholm's, the city of Stockholm, of course, did immediately was hire its first ever head of security. They'd never had a head of security before and started to think about how to adjust the urban fabric in response to this. And we, of course, were working on this exhibition exactly that time, so we commissioned three different designers to make prototypes of a, of a infartshinder in Swedish, a bollard, um, that, that conformed to the brief that the city was setting for its new, uh, its new uh, bollards. Um, the security industry wants cities to buy this kind of thing, and we're all supposed to think these don't exist, these are some other category of thing. This is the parliament, the national parliament. These stainless steel bollards are somehow supposed to not be a part of our visual range, but of course they are. We recognize that they're there to tackle a threat. We don't feel reassured, I at least never feel reassured by more police and more objects from the security industry. So in a very instrumental direct way, we, took, we made these at one-to-one, -one, um, invited the head of security from Stockholm and from other cities here for a conversation about it. This was a third um, version, a rotating version. Um, and what's interesting about that is that it led to us being not on the culture pages of the newspapers, but on the news pages of the newspapers, debating about what an open city in the wake of terrorism might look like. And we, in fact, convinced Stock the city of Stockholm to deploy some of, these, um, some of these in reality, and we're still working on them becoming, uh, scaling up and becoming a larger scale thing. But this is on the very street where that attack happened. And this kind of work happens in the context of policy, and we're following that line. So we now have an innovation project called Street Moves, which is a project to take forward um, modular prototypes on the streets of Stockholm and now nationally about how um, a city with fewer cars in it will use the spaces of the roads and, um, and culminates in this recent project. And this is my last, the last thing I want to talk about, a project called Visions in the North, Vikhonri Noor, where we are working Together with other state agencies, together with six northern Swedish municipalities, there's very fast change coming to northern Sweden for all sorts of reasons that have to do mainly with new technologies and new investment in large-scale manufacturing in the north of Sweden and new mines and other things. Um, and those municipalities are in a panic to provide the housing that they need to provide for these kinds of um, large influxes of people. We have created a context where these municipalities could work together with teams of architects and designers to ask bigger questions about the future of their municipality or region. This is just one example from the city of Kiruna, where a Sami artist 
um, was the leader of a team looking at how a disused mining area could be turned back into a leisure environment and a housing environment. Um, making the native people, the indigenous people of, of Sweden involved in these kinds of processes is something that we've been able to do that is very, very rare at the moment in, in the Swedish context. And this is the work they made, which is a beautiful idea of taking this former mining area um, and placing uh, buildings that are being demolished in other parts of the city there as a kind of building exhibition um, and, a, and a kind of leisure landscape. So this, this work continues. This is kind of really new. Um, and a new role for the museum, working with a regional scale um, together with other national agencies, but always feeding talent into the system. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Hopefully that's opened up enough uh, things through the projects to talk about without any conclusions. Thanks. So I think that uh, Kent, Kent and Kusen, Danish Architectural Centre, It's, it's really amazing to be together with people who have, you know, myself being quite old, who have worked with this much longer than myself. So uh, it's really, it's really insp an, an inspiration, as uh, Kieran is saying. Um, it's, it's really awesome. Um, so 20 minutes is a very short time. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I think the, um, the agenda of today uh, is so important. So what I'll try to do is not so much to speak about what we do, but rather how we do it as an answer to how do we become the architecture center of the 21st century, or what should architecture centers do uh, to become that for the broader public? And um, the answer is here. We should uh, democratize our institutions. Are they not? No, they are not. That would be my argument. So what you will hear now is a relatively bold argument. It might be simple, uh, but that's just to, to make it simple, actually, to make it obvious in 20 minutes. So short on DAC, it's a non-profit national cultural institution. We have a partnership with three ministries, meaning the government or the state, and a private uh, philanthropic association. Uh, they, the state, come with 15, 17% of our total annual revenue. The rest we get from Real Dania and from our own uh, income, generated income. So that's one big thing to be kind of aware of to understand our institution. We need to fight for our right to party, in the sense that to be in the game. Because if we are not having guest visitors, we will not have an economy in balance. So who was it talking about KPIs earlier? You? So we have three KPIs. And I have fought like for 10 years to get that, because the state wants uh, 271 KPIs. But I've boiled that, boiled that down to three. So that's the amount of total guests who participates in what we do and uh, what digital reach do we have. How satisfied are they? So we measure every day, are you satisfied as visitors with what you do when you visit us? And an economy, as it says, we're, we're a nonprofit, but we should balance the economy. We cannot make a deficit. So we, 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 uh, we, that's kind of our situation. It's to put it you know, very, very simple. When, when we're talking about what is our framework, and, and Kieran was just um, so nice to, to, you know, to give your, your where, where are the frames for what you work with. And we actually decided to stick to Vitruvius in the sense that it, it, sounds, it might sound funny, but it's deadly serious uh, to say that it's about uh, stability, durability, uh, it's about utility, can it actually be used to something? And does it have an artistic strive? Does it have beauty? Does it fight for beauty? So, so it's, it's very old fashioned, but we still argue that that's, that's what we can work with. So we are not really, you know, we don't think we should work with 
everything that's not about that. So that's just to give you a frame. And, um, and we believe that the future of architecture, so it's a little alive up here. Someone previous had the same, now we've got all the arguments. Let's see if I can. So we believe that the future of architecture museum, museums is in democratizing institutions. Not so many people know this, but year, the EU are making uh, surveys. In Denmark, we have an annual survey. So who's actually visiting art museums, museums in general? Anyone have a bit? I'll have one. Uh, a woman, plus 50, well-educated, might bring her daughter. That's like 70% of those going to museums in Europe, including Italy. Maybe even a little worse in Italy. Uh, I call it worse, because it's not good enough. Kieran, you were talking about um, that the institution can be a platform for depolarization. That's very close to our value. That's very close to our idea, which is also everyone's idea here, I guess. Education, dialogue, debate is the best vaccination not to get polarized and not to get fundamental. It's an old idea. You can call it modern, you can call it antique, but it's still that idea, and, and we think that, we believe that the institutions should take it serious and recognize that it is a problem, it is a challenge, that a young, uneducated guy, for instance, working in a building site, they never go to museums. Why? because they feel dumb even before arriving. They know they will feel dumb when they get in. What do we else know? We know that 68% uh, of people don't read texts. Today we say we have the span of goldfish. That's like three seconds. If we want to have more people in, not us, we read. We can stay and read a text for minutes. But the majority, that's like 72%, Reading texts, those who read texts, they leave when they go beyond 12 seconds. You can just see it, you can just measure it. So what does that mean when we're talking about strategically wanting to do that? And, uh, and I'll try to, to share that with you. This is our core narrative. That's kind of the story of uh, who we are and what we are here for. And I mean, this is kind of for you guys, it's like, Oh, we understand that, you know, we're all in contact with architecture, but we don't really know it, we don't think about it, but it has an enormous impact on us. So therefore, our task is as a national architecture center and international cultural attraction to share knowledge and engage, in particular engage people in the sustainable development of our physical framework for life through exhibitions, tours, events, learning, and professional in-person digital networks. That was a long one, but the point being, of course, that we need to have people in. They need to meet, not us, but the competency of getting in dialogue, meeting architecture, getting to understand the importance of architecture, and most importantly, feel comfortable about having an opinion and thereby being engaged in, you know, voting for something, against something, just like you showed, Kieran, uh, having an opinion, feeling comfortable about that. I think we're all having it like that, that if we don't know a shit about anything, we rather uh, shut up. But if we can give that to people, we think we are play, playing an, a role as an institution of the future. So we are saying our promise is living architecture and design. So it's easier said than done. It's actually much, much easier said than done. And that's the point of the next minutes here, to say that it, um, <clears throat> it's recognized that few people know and visit architecture museums compared to museums. Architecture is complex as it is not only an aesthetic feel. We've heard about that this morning and now also from, from you, Kieran. Uh, so, so we recognize this is different, and I'm not saying that going into an art museum is only about aesthetics. It could be about social plastics, whatnot, but certainly architecture has that complexity. So often we first realize the impact of architecture when it fails. That's, I mean, we all 
realized that these years, obviously, but, but that goes through history. So <clears throat> one example, I'm not quite sure whether it's an example of failing or it's most people, most architects, most planners would say so, but the truth is that now you're getting paper on these small houses. Now it's actually taking people from nothing, nothing into something that starts making them citizens. We can discuss this, you have strong opinion, I know, but, but, but I think it's interesting that slum is actually, as we speak, the strongest kind of, uh, kind of leverage of people into being a citizen uh, in these years. So, is it just a fail? No, but we could do it better. So the impact of climate change, migration, urbanization, and demographies are obvious forces of massive changes. We need to earn to deserve the attention of the people. Architecture museums should be relevant for the many. Now, this can sound very pro proclamatory. It is, actually. It's, it's an opinion, um, but it takes something. That demands informed strategic layouts and strong long-term change of actions and activities. So that's my point. Uh, and I don't know how much time I have back. But the point is actually that you really have to want to do this in order for it to happen. So we have a vision, we have a mission. Maybe I'll just skip it because I think I already said it, but it's really about having people in and having them to realize that they could be part of this. We have a brand new building. We opened four years ago. It was designed by Rem Kolos to much regret for Danish architects and the Danish press, we were totally criticized. But that's also news. So we got a lot of attention on that, bad attention. Uh, but it's functioning perfect. We are so happy about that building and so are our audiences. But come to Copenhagen, come to Stockholm, come to uh, Tallinn, uh, the museums from this morning, I think we all know them, we, you have all visited but come to Scandinavia and experience the places themselves. We won't have time to go into them today. So what we say is that we, we, we believe that the sector, meaning architects, planners, all the people, creative people are working in this sector. This is where it all comes from. But what is really important is to get into the culture of society, meaning the broader amount of people living in society relating to architecture. So basically, why do more people go to museums than they go to architecture museums? It's much more important, you could argue. So what it means here, and this is a very important, ridiculous, ugly little drawing, but it's very important in the sense that here you have all those who are already familiar with DAC, with architecture, that could in Denmark be like 30,000 a year. They might even come twice. That would be 60,000, but we're not satisfied. We want to go out there, much further out to those who are unfamiliar with architecture and unfamiliar with DSE in particular. And that takes uh, something. So here, I am probably see now that I already put much too content in, but the point is that we separate between a lot of activities here or over here uh, of the sector, architects, planners, politicians and so forth, and culture, which is really for the broad, we cater for the broad amount of people, citizens, and then we try to see how can they cross-pollinate each other. Uh, people giving back to the sector, but in particular the sector giving back in debates, in different formats, and you can see them there. And we, um, we worked quite deliberate and instrumental on this which is also into institutions, something really demanding, because a lot of people, art historians, like there are many of here today, they really like to go into the depth of things, but maybe they are more interested in the depth of things than in the accessibility of things for others. So that discussion is very important when we're talking about leadership, management, going, in front and trying to have people work on these agenda. So we even curate and communicate, not even, we do cu curate and communicate according to specific design principles. So we are contemporary and relevant. We communicate a human, relatable story for ordinary people 
it could say. We recognize different perspectives and prerequisites and communicate accordingly. So we have to talk with and to people who would never have considered going into an architecture museum. For the last two years after having implemented this strategy, for some reasons, we have managed to have quite a substantial part of, I'm saying this as a positive thing, Muslim mother groups bringing their kids into the institution because we cater for them. But you have to speak with them so they actually feel welcome and safe because they speak in another social code. So we communicate in an engaging way that appeals to the senses, quite important. We talked about it earlier, you know, how can we get out of just showing drawings, for instance. We keep the in-person and digital guest journey before, under, after visits in mind when designing experiences. So everyone who's working in DAC is a host. You cannot just walk through the institution and not look at the visitors. You have to look them in the eyes, you have to smile, you have to be available for the visitors. We take responsibility when something is not functioning. All of you know how a pair of goggles are hanging in the museum and they're just hanging there and nothing is happening. So we're working on that. How can we prevent that? Because when people experience that, they experience they don't really care about me. They don't care about it's not functioning. So things like that, they can be very small. And then we love our colleagues because if we feel loved, we, we're actually much better at making uh, happy guest experiences. Our marketing is about breaking through the noise. That was the next kind of uh, you know, shaming we got from the Danish architectural and design community. So not only did we pick a Dutch architect to build a building in Denmark where we have good architects, but we also picked a Canadian designer, Bruce Mao, to do our uh, logo, our entire identity. Um, and, and, and we have a strong tradition of being very, very nice in our and, and beautiful in our uh, graphics in Denmark. But I, I said a little away with beauty, uh, let's break the noise, make, make it, for instance here, you, as you can see, it's spatial, DAC, and we make it alive and it moves around, stuff like that. It has to be closer to the audience, to the audience that is not looking at it as architects or designers. So when we do exhibitions, which is about something, and I won't go into the real substance, but here it is, how can we have people to want to use circular, circular materials, building materials, if it's not beauty? So how do we make a, a, a <coughs> maybe not Venetian, but, but, but certainly a carpet out of the facade using, using simply rusted materials that's supposed to go into the, to the landfill? This is actually recycled building materials, all of it. So we built it in one to one. So people can sit in there, they can work in there, they can even sleep in there, the kids do that, uh, to make it accessible. So the question about uh, how do we communicate architecture, we talked about it this morning, always in a scale. It's a challenge. We have debates, we have talks, we have talks like every Tuesday morning, we gather one to 200 people, they're discussing all the big things in society that has to do with architecture. Within the last half year, it's become so popular that there are demonstration outsides now, which is part of being a platform which matters, we think, even though it's only 200. But of course, we take that uh, and put it into our uh, digital uh, channels and, and thereby really you know, trying to take all the content we have into the cloud, which means that we have 15 million Google visits, or what do you call them, showings. We have uh, 150,000 uh, followers. We have 50,000 new newslet 50, newsletters. So, so the fact of getting out there, as uh, you were also talking about this morning, uh, getting out there where people are, to drag them in partly, but also to share material, discussions, we think, we think that's really, really uh, important. 
And we have an app, because as we say, uh, which differs quite a lot from the other guys here, all of you, we don't have a collection. Our collection is the city. It's just out there. That's the collection, one-to-one, -one, because architecture should be experienced in one-to-one. -one. I think Kieran and I and others might could discuss this question about authenticity of the original drawing. I'm not sure it's that important. We can make facsimiles that is so high quality that even you guys would be a little insecure <laughs> today. So why do you insist on dimmering all the light? So people say, what's happening here? Instead of putting it into the light because it's just a fake. But it doesn't matter if it communicates, I would argue. So we're a little bold in that respect. We say that the city, urban spaces, is the biggest classroom in the world. So we go out there, there you can learn about architecture, about mathematics, and all so that was talking about. But we also do exhibitions. So we did, for instance, under COVID, we said, well, well nobody, no, no, no tourists will come to Copenhagen. All the families in Copenhagen, they are, they're barred in. Uh, they can't go out, so what can they do? So we created an exhibition that lasted more than six, seven months, Kids City where we, you can see we are, we're talking about scale over here on the right hand side, and we're talking about mobility, and we're talking about how, how come that in Copenhagen that you can walk or bicycle to school feeling safe, because architects, designers, planners did something, not to cherish the architects, but to say that architecture matters, and that you can be part of that. So here we have, Bjarke that we heard about earlier this morning. <laughs> so Bjarke is an is a, is a Andy Warhol within architecture somehow. And of course, uh, full power here. Very theoretical, but very, very experiential in the sense of lot to look at, lot too many maybe models and drawings. Uh, full power It's really about experiencing rather than discursively reading. Because that's, as Bruno Sevi, as we know, who's one of my favorite, said that that was kind of the ontological core of architecture, spatial experience. Uh, and here, one of our last exhibitions, the, the one running now, which is about, uh, yeah, women in architecture, forgotten women and new women in architecture. Here, uh, different foreign architect, female architects doing installation with relation to Virginia Woolf, um, what do you call it, um, book called A Room of One's Own, which is a kind of, yeah, a kind of um, important text about what it means to become a modern woman uh, uh, in the previous century in, in regard to being part of creating something. So thank you. Museum, museum. museum, sorry. <laughs> I am a two user too. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, um, hello to everybody and um, and um, I don't know, was it the organizer's intention to, uh, to leave the woman for the, for the, <laughs> for the last <laughs> presentation, <laughs> but uh, uh, here I am, and I come from Tallinn, from Estonia, and as, uh, as Kent said, please uh, come to all of our uh, museums, which are not, um, uh, maybe not so popular destinations, um, destinations yet. Um, Estonian Museum of Architecture is a um, national museum. We are subordinated or, um, to the Ministry of Culture. Um, and it has its advantages as well as, um, as maybe not so um, bright sides of being the National Museum, uh, maybe, the, uh, maybe the problem which, um, uh, which faces um, all of these kind of museums are uh, the lack of funding, of course. But, um, and uh, Estonia is a um, super small country, uh, probably it's the smallest country which has architectural museum in the world which is uh, 1.3 mil million uh, people altogether. Um, and um, our museum, it works like this, sorry. No. How it goes from there? Oh, from here, okay. Um, and um, it celebrated its um, uh, 30th 
uh, 3-0 um, birthday uh, last, uh, last year, so it means we have uh, grown along with a young state um, uh, since it uh, broke free from the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, modern culture, along with architecture, has played a defining role in the construction of the Estonian uh, self-identity and the formation of the nation state, the abundance of the museums established in the 1990s in Estonia uh, after we regained our independence, um, uh, resulting in one of the Europe's highest number of museums per capita, uh, reflects the importance of memory and historical continuity embodied uh, in collecting the material uh, culture. Uh, so. Um, and uh, there has been uh, um, today already discussions about the legacy of modernity and how the audience um, uh, relates to uh, modern project and modern architecture. So uh, for us, um, um, as a young country, uh, the modern architecture uh, emerged uh, in 1920s and 30s. It was the same time when Estonia uh, gained its independence from the imperial Russia. We, 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 um, had our independence 20 years before the Second World War. So for us, this uh, kind of um, modern, or let's call it functionalist architecture, at, at it, as it was called at that time in our region, uh, was part of our national identity and modern project. And, uh, and um, we um, appreciate it maybe differently than, um, than in some, let's say, older countries. Um, that is one of the citations from the uh, eight, uh, uh, 82, uh, the chairman of the Estonian Association of Architects sent to the uh, government, to the Soviet Estonian government at that time. And uh, to me, it still defines maybe that many architects still think that what would be the ideal architectural museum, it would be the, um, they called it that time, propaganda house, which is quite funny, uh, <laughs> funny statement. And it should be located in the center of the city in a nice um, old building bath in light late into the evening. Uh, there should be exhibitions, cinema halls, cafes, salons, sales and consultation points. Um, and um, so I guess this um, was their idea in the, uh, in the mid uh, or early 80s. Uh, and, uh, and they actually accomplished this um, project in 1991 when the museum uh, was established um, with the help of the uh, Architects Association of, of Estonia at that time. Um, yeah. <coughs> uh, usually the uh, growth in architectural museums' uh, popularity in the 1970s and 80s uh, are uh, associated with the spread of postmodernism, where architecture came into value foremost as an intellectual project. Architectural drawings gained the status as an independent artistic medium. Uh, we visually appealing works already originally meant for communicating with the public. Uh, it deliberately shifted also the focus away from uh, completed uh, architectural structures or buildings uh, to the process, to the idea, creating an image of uh, architecture that deals with production of knowledge, practices and ways of thinking about the world rather than objects in the built environment. Uh, this focus has remained one of the essential characteristics of architectural exhibitions and the collections uh, policy in the museums and is also valid in, um, in our case in Estonia. And uh, for example, there is a, a photo I mentioned you, Mirko, earlier <laughs> today. Uh, there was an um, architect's group called Tallinn School, uh, active in uh, late, uh, late 70s and uh, 1980s whose conscious effort to construct the architecture as a critical part of the late socialist public sphere addressed also the understanding the role of both the architect and the soon to be created architecture museum. Should it, uh, should it be orientated towards historical representation or uh, be uh, an active platform for transforming the uh, discipline? So uh, that's... Um, you, you, have to, uh, you have to bear in mind that that's uh, still in uh, Soviet uh, times. Uh, behind the Iron Curtain, one group of Estonian uh, architects managed to uh, be part of the uh, famous magazine Casabella, and uh, in addition to the cover of, of this uh, Estonian architecture uh, chessboard, uh, there was an extensive story also 
uh, inside of the magazine. Uh, so the architectural um, museums are not uh, a phenomena which is external to the de development of architecture as a discipline. Uh, formation of the museum as archive and arena has had a strong impact on the development of the public image of the architecture. A museum has a, le a legitimizing function. It defines architectural discipline as a culture with its own self-value, uh, not the mere summary of technological and practical needs. So uh, who we are? Uh, it's our building, it's, um, it's our birthday. So um, uh, we celebrated our 30th birthday last uh, summer as, as the late queen, actually. We, we celebrated the <laughs> uh, birthday in the summer, although we have a birthday in January, actually. So it's um, nicer, uh, nicer weather to, to have a party. Um, and as most architectural museums, we are mm, focused on 20th century and contemporary architecture. Uh, we do have collection and, uh, and, uh, and uh, can't we think it's important to have collection? <laughs> can't, can't have another argument. And um, our collection has a national, national uh, scope. Um, and for the last 25 years, we have housed in this building. It's a former industrial building, um, salt storage, uh, part of the former industrial area, which is now, uh, now turned into a very vibrant, uh, active um, city block or city quarter in the center of Tallinn. And um, so um, in that sense, architects, if you remember the citation I showed you uh, before, then they got the nice historical building in the city uh, center. Uh, it's true that we don't have a um, theater and restaurant yet. But um, we have staff of 12. Um, and it means that we uh, do have active cooperation with independent curators and, and uh, designers. And, uh, um, and I think architecture, in one hand, is a very public sub subject that uh, concerns us, everyone, inhabiting um, uh, built, uh, sp built spaces. But on the other, it's also a highly specific field. Uh, which its own geometrical and technical language regulations and uh, hermetic stylistic vocabulary that only professionals can untie. Architecture Museum stands somewhere in the intersection of those opposites. It functions both as an institutional body who safeguards the legitimacy of the profession through its archives and collection policy, but who also has to have a critical view on the built space and uh, start the dialogue with, uh, with the public, as we have heard so many times already today. Unlike, uh, unlike art museums, we have to be attractive and communicate, uh, communicative without the possibility to show uh, the actual buildings in our halls and the way we talk stories uh, has a crucial uh, importance. Um, so <clears throat> some um, images now from our activities. Um, we do have permanent exhibition and I think it's only uh, it's one of the very um, important functions for the architecture. Museums do um, have permanent exhibition uh, because um, uh, almost uh, half of our visitors are tourists uh, for the first time in Tallinn, in Estonia. So um, uh, they are this kind of um, exhibitions are important uh, also for the uh, school children and etc. So. Um, uh, so um, we uh, mostly show our uh, model collection in this um, uh, exhibition in our um, ground floor. Altogether, we have four floors and uh, almost 3,000 uh, square meters uh, space. Um, it's kind of images also everybody likes to show nowadays. <laughs> it's public, public programs, children in a city. Uh, so uh, as, as we know, buildings are not inside of the museum, but outside of the museum walls. Uh, so there is a workbook we did uh, for the school children, and it's a very popular program uh, we um, do um, outside in the area of this former industrial Rotterman area where museum is located. Uh, and um, kids can learn about um, uh, uh, urban uh, design and urban um, or, or design details in urban space, like uh, urban furniture, etc. Um, and we do also a public um, or open houses uh, excursions. Uh, so once, uh, once a month maybe, uh, we take people to the houses they usually don't have access to. 
we have done it for, I don't know, five years now, and they are one of the most popular things we do. Um, space experience, we have a wonderful cellar. Uh, it used to be a space for temporary exhibitions, but now it's uh, uh, turned into permanent exhibition for a spatial experience. So you can touch, you can smell, you can climb, you can, um, it's the a mirror uh, floor. Um, and uh, it's the opening, we have the, had the dancers there. So it's for the kids and maybe for kid or child-minded persons. Um, so it's no text there, or very short text, and um, it's more like um, uh, for, the, uh, for the experience. Uh, it's another, it was um, designed um, in collaboration with the architecture school for kids. We have also in our premises. Uh, and um, the um, things which actually came directly from this collaboration was this uh, sphere. So it was the, uh, one of the objects the kids suggested that the ideal exhibition should have this kind of sphere you can um, climb into and just be alone there. Uh, so our exhibition programs, um, mm, here is, uh, here is uh, some um, <coughs> examples of our different um, approaches and different uh, uh, focus. Uh, we have, um, we do uh, two main exhibitions or two big exhibitions in our main exhibition hall, which is around uh, 500 square meters, uh, and uh, like two or three smaller ones in a gallery. And it's uh, the image from the architectural comic, uh, comics exhibition, which was very um, interesting and, uh, and successful, actually, by two Belgian and French um, authors, Francois Asquetten and Benoit Peters. Um, and, uh, and we published also and translated into Estonian one of those uh, comics uh, books they, uh, they, uh, uh, they have uh, published. In, uh, and... Um, that's an example, example how to do or how to bring a building into the museum, uh, or at least piece of it. So it's, um, sometimes we like to do crazy projects, and that's exactly one of those. Um, in the central London, uh, in the 19, uh, early 1990s, there was uh, blown up uh, the Baltic Exchange building uh, by Irish uh, terrorists. Um, and the remains or pieces of this uh, building were sold in auction. And uh, it happens that Estonian businessmen bought them, uh, or bought these uh, tens of sea containers of uh, um, old building from London uh, with the idea to, uh, to erect it, at least to erect the facade, um, re-erect it uh, in the central Tallinn. Of course, um, central Tallinn is mostly protected by a heritage board. It's a UNESCO town, et cetera, et cetera. So no permission was given, of course. So it was stayed for almost 10 years in the sea containers in the harbor, not far from Tallinn. And we have a program of spatial intervention in our, uh, program of spatial intervention. So uh, we um, ask um, architects uh, to, to do something with our space. So we ask one of the Estonian uh, office called Salto uh, to do something in our space. And they found the story and they um, uh, proposed to uh, open up one of those boxes or containers, and bring part of this uh, building to live again. So it's uh, the front tone of, the, uh, of this former building. Um, and it's uh, the goddess of Britannia uh, in the middle. Uh, it uh, weighed 14 tons, and uh, we had to brought it to the second floor. So it has a big endeavor in, in itself. And uh, the um, intervention was to put those railings um, in the middle of the hall. And so the, every visitor entering the hall, it was quite dark there, pushed the red button, and then the central uh, goddess um, moved towards you, <laughs> and then slowly toward the smooth back. So it was, um, it was um, I wouldn't say, it, it, public audience-wise, it wasn't a big success. It wasn't only um, less than two months. Uh, 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 the exhibition uh, lasted, but, uh, but as a story, as an as a experiment, uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience, of, uh, of course. So, and uh, later the goddess went back to the container and it's still in somewhere in near Tallinn in the harbor uh, waiting its um, destiny because it's clear that you can't build it up in, uh, in Tallinn at least. 
Uh, the, sorry, that was the original um, picture of it, how it was in. Now it's uh, this uh, normal Foster's Gerkin is in the same place in the uh, city of London. And that was the, <laughs> that was the piece which was uh, brought, uh, brought here. Another one, one of those uh, interventions is uh, we had this um, spring sound noise space, so it was how, um, how sound also makes space. So the visitors were asked to sit uh, in the middle of the hall uh, with this uh, surrounded loudspeakers uh, with uh, 16 different channels. And, um, and those two guys were actually two musicians uh, who, um, who uh, recorded then different noises from the uh, nature and as well as from the urban um, uh, in, uh, environment. So um, again, one of those um, quite simple ideas, um, uh, connection between space and, and sound. That's one of my favorite uh, things we did already uh, quite many years ago. It was experimental uh, exhibition with the students of interior architecture in the Academy of Arts in Estonia. Uh, Expedition Wunderlich. Wunderlich is a nice name, but it, it's actually the family name of the first um, interior architect, uh, professor of interior architecture in, uh, in Estonia in 1930s. Uh, so all the um, uh, Estonian interior architects somehow consider themselves as the students of, uh, of him. And uh, it was um, did as a performance, so uh, the students were um, uh, it, was, it lasted only, uh, or it uh, happened only in the weekends because there was no students had to be at school during the, during the week. So uh, every visitor, when visitor came in, the student um, lifted the panel with the original drawing of the, uh, some student work uh, to his eyes. It was a velvet, a black velvet. Uh, 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 black uh, uh, panels covered with black velvet, etc., etc. So it was kind of a performance in self uh, or theat theatrical performance to enter to the hall and uh, and to see the, uh, those uh, original drawings um, uh, from the uh, students of different era from the 60s, 70s, 80s. Critical voice, uh, as um, as uh, Kent showed. We did the same exhibition already, 19, <laughs> already three years ago. A uh, room of, of phones own, again, feminist questions to architecture. And um, actually the picture is taken from one of our storage spaces. So the exhibition also extended to the storage spaces, which were next to the main exhibition hall. So uh, somehow also the exhibition um, layout used uh, the uh, spaces which are usually um, not uh, accessible to the wider, uh, wider audience. And it was a hugely popular exhibition, I can say. Uh, the houses that we need uh, was a reaction to the climate uh, change and the critical energy crisis and the uh, critical questions uh, which surround us. Um, uh, last summer, it was also part of our um, birthday celebration, this kind of exhibition we asked uh, from um, 15 Estonian architects, designer, landscape architects, uh, to, uh, to build the house or to, to propose the house we need for the future. So and in the uh, foreground, you see the house, which is uh, as a jacket, for example, with made of wool. The other modernism uh, exhibition I did myself uh, two years ago, Leisure Spaces, Holidays and Architecture in 20th Century Architecture. Uh, 20th Century um, Estonia, so it was about um, uh, summer houses and um, leisure uh, architecture meant for leisure, which is kind of topic which is never researched uh, uh, before. Uh, monographic um, exhibitions, we do them as well, of course. Such, we are such a small country that we have to have a really good story to, uh, to put it up for the monographic exhibition. And we did it, uh, August Comment, and it was Estonian-born engineer. Um, this guy who escaped during the Second World War to the States, and um, by wonder, uh, he, um, or it was a miracle, that he met uh, Louis Kahn, one of the most famous uh, architects of the 20th century, who happens also to be born in a uh, 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 small island of Estonia, but he left it at the age of three. So, but uh, apparently they uh, shared some Estonian um, language between them uh, later in the States in the 50s. 
So August the government went to, went to states and introduced concrete technique uh, to, um, to Louis Kahn. They remained lifelong friends until uh, the death of Louis Kahn. And, uh, and yeah, we did a magnific magnificent exhibition uh, with a cooperation with Philadelphia uh, archive uh, with, uh, with a lot of originals also from Kahn uh, archive. So it was uh, really uh, and here you see it's not only Louis Kahn, but also uh, Moshe Safdie's uh, experimental habitat in Montreal, which he, uh, the same guy, the August Commandant, helped to uh, realize. Uh, that's the exhibition we, had, we have at the moment. That's the Edible Italian Architecture Bernale. Uh, it's about um, exhibitions as a practice-based research and, uh, and um, collaboration with academia. Both curators are, one is from Barcelona, the other is from Cooper Union in, state, in New York, so it's um, academic research uh, done in uh, uh, faculties of architecture around the world, around the Europe at least, uh, presented in, uh, in the exhibition, uh, as an exhibition as a labor laboratory, I would say. Uh, also, in every two years, they erect uh, connection to the Biennale, the new pavilion in front of our museum, which is one of the most popular ways to communicate modern architecture to the wider audience and to make this kind of place. And uh, last but not least, uh, the story of building, which are the most, it's very simple idea, it's very um, conceptually not so challenging, but uh, what interests people most is quite simply, 100 buildings, 100 years. So <laughs> it was story of buildings, uh, one, one most important building per year, um, it was, um, uh, exhibition which we installed when Estonia uh, celebrated its 100th uh, anniversary and uh, it was extremely popular and um, so it means that all those experimental exhibitions but in addition we also showed two exhibitions which, um, uh, which uh, attract a uh, uh, wider audience um, as well. So to the last some um, challenges I, uh, I think I am I wanted to, as to stress, so specificity of uh, or challenges for the architecture museum. So specificity of the medium is something we have discussed a lot already. Uh, drawings, is, uh, drawings are something that only architects can read. And um, as you see, there are, they are the two architects here who are actually watching their own drawing. Uh, collections and public agenda, how um, I think it's this kind of uh, translation, how to uh, we have a um, rich archive, rich uh, um, collections in, our, in all our museums' um, um, stores, but actually how to put it into very attract attractively uh, to the public, uh, public use and public agenda, how to use it for a public agenda, I think that's one of the uh, big questions. Uh, collaborations, as I said, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, we do a lot of, uh, or also architectural museums should collaborate with um, academia, with other research institutes. Um, uh, we do also with, uh, for example, Association of Architects, uh, um, etc. So it's, uh, uh, it should be collaborative uh, practice. Uh, one of the huge uh, challenges, of course, we haven't discussed uh, today much is uh, digitalization. It's both regards of um, archive as well as uh, our presence in a digital realm as a museum, uh, how to use uh, digital uh, means, and also institutional framing, reframing. Um, architecture museums tend to be um, connected to the other disciplines also, like architecture design is maybe most common. Uh, they are establishing a new one, for example, in, in Finland in a few years. So the Finnish Architecture Museum and Design Museum will be merged. Um, in Swedish case, there is, um, it's only in the name, but still it's Architecture and Design Center. Um, so in, um, uh, in Holland, in Rotterdam, the new institute, which used, used to be um, Dutch, Architectural Inst Dutch Architectural Institute, now is something between architecture, fashion, and uh, multimedia. So who knows what it is. And, um, and also in Asia, they, uh, they uh, opened up uh, just last year M+, which is architecture plus visual culture, so it's, uh, and design. So it's uh, also this kind of uh, 
uh, things which um, I think is important to have in mind. And to the very last, um, uh, the current debate in Estonia, which is also reflects to the war, uh, to the architecture, and to the, uh, uh, to the um, museums. <coughs> so, um, um, as we know, um, our um, uh, neighboring country, Russia, has invaded uh, Ukraine, and uh, it has um, you know, the war which started on the Soviet legacy. And Estonia, as being part for 50 years of Soviet Union, we have filled these uh, Soviet um, buildings, monuments, etc. And now, uh, suddenly, for 30 years, we lived with them, and it was okay. But now there was a um, Minister of Justice um, released the order, or how you say, this kind of command, uh, to um, erase all the monuments, or to to, uh, to erase all the monuments, and also, which is more interesting, even to erase all the Soviet symbols also from the buildings. So there you see one of the buildings from '54 in the center of Tallinn, uh, which is you can call from those Stalinist style uh, buildings, which has this red cross, red star, sorry, uh, on top of its uh, tower. Uh, so the idea. Nobody knows it is quite fresh still, but uh, the idea is uh, that you have to somehow um, erase or remove uh, this uh, star from the building because it's um, a violent uh, symbol in the public, public space. And what is uh, the solution which Ministry of, uh, Minister of Justice uh, proposed? Uh, let's uh, bring everything to the museum. So its museum is considered as a at a store, as a neutral place where everything can be uh, brought together and, uh, uh, and uh, it's not harmful uh, anyway, uh, any more than when uh, those, um, there is an image of Estonian History Museum where all those uh, Stalin and uh, Lenin sculptures are uh, brought together. It's, of course, a little bit earlier process, but now this um, tendency is even more uh, stronger and, and uh, my argument would be that uh, the museums are not the places which are uh, neutral arenas uh, to bring in uh, everything and uh, and um, that this kind of they are more places for debate and and um, reframing this kind of uh, questions which are have aroused uh, in in public uh, public sphere so is it is it so so thank you very much thank you. So, first of all, thank you very much. And um, perhaps one thing that I could try, I'm trying to make an effort to build uh, some uh, red lines uh, among the, the three different presentations and then open uh, with one comment uh, on one point. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, first of all, in respect to my dark uh, introduction, uh, which, by the way, is still dark, so it's not a personal view. That is the reality. Uh, um, there is this kind of, uh, I would like to underline this kind uh, of um, positive attitude. This morning, uh, uh, Antoine Picon was speaking of optimism. Uh, architecture is inevitably positive, is uh, thinking uh, of the future, is thinking of transformation, is thinking uh, of uh, projects uh, through which to obtain certain things and certain modification. Even if you don't do anything, <coughs> it's still a project, it's a decision. Even if you demolish, it's a project, is a, a kind of... So there is this, uh, how can I say, basic uh, positive assumption on uh, all the production of architecture. And also considering the contemporary situation, uh, just I, I was very struck by a sentence by uh, an interview by Mike Davis, said that despair is useless. So in a certain way, we are, we have to operate, we have to go on. And what uh, comes out uh, from this presentation, I feel, is uh, the power of narratives. 
And uh, we are speaking now of uh, narratives that um, uh, is very interesting to, to see how with the political uh, and uh, military situation in which we are, how certain narratives about identity, uh, community, and this are coming back in an incredible strong way. Could be the case of Estonia, could be the case of uh, Sweden. Is a general narrative about uh, the social democratic, uh, if we want to call that uh, uh, Denmark, that uh, uh, they are really, really important. And uh, these institutions, architecture institutions, are crucial in building this narrative. But they are also crucial, as we have seen, in building the new narratives that are missing. The new narratives about uh, you know, the request coming from the society, the protest coming from the, the uh, new attention to social inequality, to gender inequality, the new attention to environmental issues, the new attention to all these kind of things. What uh, seems to me evident from the presentation that all of you did is this kind of uh, um, uh, necessity of new narratives. And in a situation like we are, seems to me, in which, again, as I mentioned, seems to me that uh, a cultural debate, we have a less and less um, um, critical voice present in this debate. Institutions like this could offer this kind of uh, space for a critical inquiry that uh, is able to be open to the different voices, as Kent was, uh, uh, was mentioning. Uh, but the other thing uh, that I feel uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, very important is that uh, um, uh, I would like to go back to this idea of uh, because there is a risk that uh, we banalize um, the, the words, the values we refer to. And uh, architects are already doing that when uh, they speak of, uh, as I said before, sustainability, when they speak of social justice and this and that. So it's a kind of greenwashing of architecture, uh, really, but a greenwashing that is also a social washing of architecture. Architecture that in the last 40 years uh, most cases has been uh, mm, uh, totally absent from uh, the discussion and reflection on uh, housing, services, you know, all the welfare state uh, uh, basic uh, um, component were out from the production of architecture and the discussion in architecture. So I feel that that is uh, institution they could play an incredible role to bring a, a critical discussion about that. It's not true that we cannot say that we agree, because in reality, if everyone agrees that we need a more sustainable thing, we don't agree on anything. Simply, we have to understand how we are now addressing these kind of things, and that is crucial. Now, the, the issues of the tools is crucial, and uh, I think that Kant raised an issue that uh, an institution is in itself a tool. So in order to address certain things, perhaps uh, mm, you have to understand the tool that you have. Perhaps you have to change the tool in order to change also the result. And that, uh, if I understand properly, is what uh, you are trying to, to, to do, mm. uh, revisiting the idea of uh, traditional idea of education that has always been present uh, in, uh, in museum and institution like this, in a kind of a conversational strategy with uh, the different publics, opening uh, to a level of conversation, to an idea of listening, also, and not only speaking, that is very, very important. Uh, there is a point that I think uh, has been raised uh, partly by, by Kieran and partly by um, Trin. Trin, sorry. Uh, 
that is speaking of the professional. Is also in the scheme of Kant that is this kind of professional. Because if we look at the issues of tools, we have, uh, I think the institution has to invest a lot on producing a deep transformation in architectural culture. Because uh, the way architectural culture is addressing the issues that we are having today is using, in a very acritical way, without any, the tools that already exist. And uh, perhaps uh, I give an example, then I would like to open the discussion. Look at what is happening with the theme of the 15 uh, minutes or 30 minutes or 20 minutes uh, uh, city. The idea that has been developed in South America, in Paris, that now is uh, present almost uh, in uh, all the larger cities in Europe, from Berlin to Barcelona to Milan. This idea of a 50 million city has been interpreted in most cases as a, a problem of a physical accessibility to certain basic services, shops, uh, uh, amenities, leisure, green. Uh, in reality, uh, this uh, uh, idea of 50 million cities, first of all, in a lot of uh, small cities, like also in Vicenza, I think, uh, already exists. So it's already a problem of accessibility in larger cities. But what is uh, hidden behind that? If we look a little bit at uh, some example in the past, we see that uh, it has always been related to a strong idea of community in a lot of proposals. For example, Leo Creer in the 70s was really relating the idea of fifth municipality to the idea of the community, the small village, that the city is a combination of small cities, and an idea of a community uh, identity. Uh, other people suggest an idea of different cities, different, uh, <coughs> different groups, different fragments, Ungers, which was able to accommodate diversity. So each of these com community, let down, I don't do it. each of these fragments had a different identity in order to represent different communities. In North America, it has been used as a way to, contest, to, to react to the land use and to produce uh, uh, a much more sustainable system of urban development based on public transportation for which density is okay. So you see, it's a tool as 15 minutes that is now a slogan has been used. Uh, desperately needs a discussion and a critical analysis because uh, what is behind that? You know, it's not the uh, mayor of Milan that is painting some uh, lines in order to create some bicycle lines. There is the problem of the services, they do not exist. You can make uh, a lot of lines, but uh, if the school is a derelict space, it's not uh, working, you don't have a medical so health service, uh, and uh, you don't have any kind of service, you can make all the bicycle lines that you want, but uh, the problem of social justice, accessibility, and this kind of stuff will never be addressed with that. So that is uh, simply an example for which I consider the role of this uh, institution crucial in order to revisit also the assumption on which architects uh, they work today. So I will add, uh, Kent, to your, uh, how can I say, um, uh, orientation to the publics. I will give uh, an equal uh, relevance to the mandate to uh, reframe the professional or architectural cultures in order to look at the contemporary mm -hmm. issues. Sorry, I tried to put together all your presentation, all your stuff, and I don't know if he, uh, you would like to, to, is there to a question? Is there a question? I'm sure that you would like to, to comment about that. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because I, I think uh, you're doing exactly what Kieran said you are doing and you're good at, uh, which is to, <laughs> to, to make it the problem so big or the horizon so big that, that it can almost, you know, the weight of obligation becomes so big that, that you don't do anything. <laughs> no, that we are crushed. No, no, so, so I, I hear what you say, but, but to be quite honest, I think the institutions, and there are differences here. Are you a public national? And or by not. the way, we are a public national, but we're actually a private foundation. We're not owned by the state. Uh, so we are uh, national institutions like ours. I think they have the obligation, first of all, really to have the broader public to have access to the field they're representing. Could be medical or whatever, but, but that's, that's the basic. Now changing the field or challenging the field is really interesting. I think we're doing it, all of us, primarily in debates. But, but, but you have to remember that typically in modernized countries like, like ours, um, the building industry would take up something like um, 10 to 20 percent of the private workforce. It's a huge industry. We're talking of hundreds of billions of euros every year. And here we are, small institutions with small budgets. So, so we can do it, but we should not over-exaggerate our potential importance, even though there are good um, intentions. Good intentions. Um, and then, then, yeah, maybe someone else. Well, I think what is the mission for the Architecture Museum to, uh, to present those very pressing uh, qu uh, questions and, and crises is, um, is to offer this kind of um, architectural vision or solution, how, as you said, we, uh, this 15-minute city, how it actually would be realized in a, in a, in a design-wise or, or what's, what's the architectural parallel or what's the architecture of this or what, what would be what would be the house we need in the future or this kind of you know this kind of uh, to because that for example the exhibition I showed which we are having at the moment the edible which was curated by two fantastic academicians but for me it actually eventually it was lacking this kind of um, uh, special quality. They showed on the tables a lot of new materials, like uh, bricks made of uh, sugar and um, uh, uh, coal, or, or um, bricks made of uh, this fungi uh, thing, mushrooms. Yeah. mushrooms. So, but they didn't offer any. Uh, you know, it was just bricks on the table. They would, uh, you know, there wasn't any. Um, what kind of buildings or what kind of spaces uh, created out of this? Uh, uh, this thing in a way, so that is something maybe which is one of the missions for the architecture museums to, to envision the space as well. I think it's a really complicated uh, um, question, but the way that we think about it um, is that, especially in a country like, so all of these have local conditions, and in a country like Sweden, there's a very strong tradition that the architect or consultant culture provides solutions to problems. Like, that's, that's still alive as a discourse in Sweden, very directly. Like, we may all know that that's a kind of myth, and, and you know, we may, be, may have given that up in the 1980s or even before, but, but in Sweden it's very much alive that a rational, top-down, analysis-based culture will solve society-scale questions with the help of people like architects. Now, you can call that a myth as much as you like, but Swedish society is built on that notion. <laughs> what, what we try to do is to say, what, what does a museum offer in that context? Well, a museum offers aesthetic experience all sorts of different kinds of aesthetic experience. It doesn't mean it only talks about aesthetics. It means it provides aesthetic experience of complex problems. And here I'm influenced by contemporary philosophers like Timothy Morton or philosophers of ecology who say the urgent question is not to say there is an environmental crisis. The urgent question is to make people want the change that is coming anyway, to, 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 make, to give people a sense of desire, to give people a sense of identification or collective life in the context of radical, traumatic, technologically-based, <coughs> human, human-caused change. And just one brief example of that, uh, I mentioned it to you over lunch, but it's, uh, in the Sigurd Leverance exhibition we showed the Woodland Cemetery, this famous cemetery by Sigurd Leverance and Gunnar Asplund in the south of Stockholm. One, it's a World Heritage Site, it's a great work of, maybe the greatest work of modern landscape design in Europe. 
extraordinary place. In the exhibition, we, we talked about it as a, you know, of course, it's this kind of national romantic landscape that then becomes a classical thing, and then later some modern things appear. But for me, what it is, it's, a, it's an artistic response to radical, traumatic technological change. You know, Stockholm is growing, especially in the south, big, so, big southern Stockholm. Industrial city is growing in the south with an industrial population dying of new things at larger numbers than have ever died before. So gigantic cemeteries are needed outside the city. There's a new law that says you can't have cemeteries in the city anymore. There's a new tunnel barn, a new underground railway, which is a new piece of technology which allows you to get there, which is being built at the time. The Spanish flu um, in, uh, epidemic comes two years after the beginning of construction of the Woodland Cemetery. And then Swedish culture decides we're not going to bury people anymore, we're going to burn their bodies. Traumatic, completely new cultural proposition that had no form, no language at all. Leverance and Aspen solved all of those problems aesthetically in, in the Woodland Cemetery. And so if you just now say 100 years later, we have the same challenge in front of ecological sustainability. How do you make citizens understand and find their place in the inevitable change rather than trying to solve the problem that you perceive they have? And that seems to me to be the task of architecture and the task of museums. Please. I have one remark and then a, a question. I'm not very convinced that the 15-minute city is something that really concerns completely architectural museum because, for example, it has to do with the geography of employment. You know, I think one of the biggest problems of 15 minutes, which is usually very often forgotten by those who promote it, is how do people commute from distant suburbs to serve the happy 15 minutes commuters, uh, usually in affluent uh, center or suburbs. So I do think, yes, there is probably an architectural dimension, but before <coughs> that, there is a huge economic and planning issue. Yeah. That may. And then I had a, more a question for, thank you for three wonderful presentation, gives hope, actually. <laughs> But I had a question because I heard two, uh, two things. One, which really, s the two struck me. The first is about consensus, that in some ways, you know, design may trigger some kind of consensus or collective belonging feeling. And at the same time, I heard that these places, the places you p represent, are also about organizing dissensus. You know, uh, not agreeing on things, but being able to talk about them. So I wanted to, to, to ask you, how do you see, you know, this relation between consensus and dissensus, you know, agreeing and disagreeing? Because you, you if I'm if I understood correctly, you're trying to do both. <laughs> this is um, a Scandinavian problem. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, talking about consensus in a Swedish context is, of course... I mean, it's also a society built on consensus, on a consensus model, not on an agonistic model. The three arguments spoke about that in different, very different places. Hmm. But you mean consensus in, in our program, but we show, or, or how we frame our exhibitions, or? The way that what you present is predicated upon a certain idea of belonging together. You know, for example, in the Estonian case, it would take more the form of a kind of national community. In Denmark, something else, which would have to be, you know, the all-inclusive society in which, you know, Muslim women, for example, feel welcome, etc. That's what I call the consensus, but at the same time, seems to me you're trying also to promote, you know, what is now currently called in the US difficult conversations. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I? Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe it's a no-go, uh, and maybe I'm moving into cancel culture, but there, there was this uh, English historian, Arnold Toynbee. I don't know if he's... Can we speak about Arnold Toynbee? <laughs> 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 but <clears throat> but, but uh, Toynbee... Uh, about in the 60s, 70s, said something I think is interesting, uh, which I'm getting to your point, but, but he said, uh, when, when people are sitting in the 21st century, way into the 21st century, looking back, looking into the 20th century, they would not, if they look about the real achievement, they would not talk about landing on the moon or a big wall as much as they would or should perhaps consider that the biggest achievement of the 20th century was that for the first time in the history of humanity, did we actually dare to think 
a dignified welfare for all people on the earth. And then he said, as a practical objective goal. As a practical object goal. And there you have your 15 minutes town. Because, and, and in that way, Danes are Swedes, in the sense that we, we, we actually believe that it's so important to get to that consensus. But we can discuss and we can hate each other. And we have philosophers who have Grundvig argued for it. You should exactly talk with the one you hate the most, for instance. So, so it's very embedded. But the goal is, as you say, it is to get to the consensus. And I would say today, and I would, even, I would really stand on that, uh, aren't we all afraid of Europe cracking down now? I am, personally. Uh, so that creating that consensus according to fundamental values, such as a dignified life, meaning getting rid of your personal waste every morning, having access to water, food, and we could move on. And I think that, that that's where maybe pushing the limit a little high, but saying that, yes, a critical critical discussion, as you were saying, or you're using another word, the, the critical discussion where we are creating that value in itself that we are critical. Uh, to us, I mean, that, that's yeah. just a way. That's just underway. But it's not, it's not a goal in itself. I know it is seen from an academic point of view. Sure. I, I just think you're, you're putting your finger precisely on the tension of Northern European life at the moment, which is <laughs> that the consensus model has completely, is broken but there's nothing to replace it. And so a project like Public Luxury, the exhibition I showed, is precisely a series of episodes about the breakdown of that consensus. I don't share quite your, I wouldn't say that my role as an institution is to build consensus, that's not how I feel. No. But it's certainly to show the evidence of what that consensus that people imagine exists as a kind of mythology of Swedish public life actually consists of today. There are certainly things that the country has in common with itself, but those things look very different to, to a model that may have been current in the height of social democracy, but you're putting your finger on precisely the tension, at least in Sweden, we work with now. Yep. I don't know if it's the same thing. Yeah, maybe I'm coming from a little bit different background. Eastern European uh, countries liberated 30 years ago. Um, mm. they, this kind of consensus uh, society, we have never reached it before now with all Krabben Stowell. I mean, it's, uh, we started from extremely neoliberal history from the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, all this kind of political regime, uh, political uh, uh, climate and, uh, and also our um, um, real estate development and, and things which are related to architecture. There was extremely, or urban planning, it was extremely, it was not, no consensus, it was just uh, um, who is stronger, the, he, it wins. I mean, it's, uh, it was nothing to do with Swedish consensus. Uh, um, thing and now it's um, now again this kind of welfare society which we actually we never somehow um, reached uh, is, is uh, yeah, so you know dissolving into all mm. those global crises and uh, and, um, and the war doesn't uh, make things uh, easier. And one more footnote on this is that all the greatest Swedish artists are the people outside of that consensus. So, so that's also an irony. Like Sigurd Leverens represents everything that the Swedish welfare state tried to forget about, like God and shopping. Like they weren't allowed. In, you know, but Leverens is deeply engaged with these things, and that's why we made an exhibition about him because he, of course, represents another path for modernity in Sweden that was not taken, but perhaps is more the path that became. You know, that we became. So you know, and if you add Ingmar Bergman and. You know, all of these figures who are rejected by their host culture but are the greatest artists of modern history in Sweden, there's a line of them. So, yeah, the consensus is not what it seems But Sweden. Don't you think that if you want uh, to uh, produce some, uh, through architecture, urban planning, uh, landscape, whatever, uh, some transformation, you know, the model uh, that has been used till now, that is uh, neoliberal society, professionals, technical solution, you offer the solution. Uh, considering that the values that uh, we are dealing with uh, are uh, fading away, and uh, the necessity to operate on the base of new or shared values in order to give a foundation to these actions that we are going to take. 
in a certain way, this process of building uh, narratives. In reality, I really believe that it's also building values. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, and uh, of course, they cannot be shared by everyone, but uh, you cannot operate without uh, a, a, cons a convergence through values, a strategy, shared instruments, if you want uh, to, to operate uh, in this new kind of, uh, of context. So it's a long process of, uh, on one say, accelerating the dismantling of certain kind of uh, things, Absolutely. on the other side, uh, accepting and yeah. promoting, no, for yeah. much, uh, how much you can, uh, the, the building of this kind of uh, narrative, values, strategies, instruments to operate uh, in, in a certain way. Is it correct? Is it correct, Ken? I, 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 I agree with you, but let me use an example of a narrative uh, a situation. We, I showed you, we, we have these discussions every Tuesday morning from eight to nine, and we have had big discussions about how do we build a new island outside Copenhagen that would be a dam to make sure that all the value of Copenhagen does not get into high water of the ocean. And that has been done almost according to all rules. The Swedes uh, disagree with us to a certain <laughs> extent, but let's not go into the substance. The point is here that, uh, and what, what I think is important also in, in, you know, in the question of the role of architecture museums in the future or centers. So we're having this debate with politicians, young people in the space, and they have used the echo chambers of the platforms, they have created now 20,000 people against doing this project. So they raise up in the space where 200 people are sitting, a politician, a minister actually up there, and they are saying, there must be something wrong with our democracy. We have now created 20,000 opponents, so why doesn't this project stop? But there are 600,000 people living in Copenhagen, and they have taken a vote on this, and it is, has been in the parliament. So my, my, my point is here that the democratic idea, the narrative of the democrat, democracy in itself, suddenly becomes a part of what are we discussing, and without being too theoretical about it. So we are in both an analog and a virtual space, and people are, in my opinion, and that's, that might be a different Kieran here, so I am actually trying to to push that consensus. And it might be a little, what is it called, oppressive tolerance. <laughs> you, know, you, might, you, you might actually push it, or we do. But really to have that discussion, no, it's not democracy because you had 20,000 people from the echo chambers to reject a master plan of the city. Does it give any meaning? So, so that narrative is actually quite direct yeah. here. So let, let's stop with this uh, and go and go ahead with some questions from. Uh... So what do you young guys over here think? I mean, you're the you're the future generation. Future of architecture museum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the role? <laughs> no role. <laughs> Thank you for the presentations. And what really struck me, and it's just an observation, not a question, was uh, the, um, the very hard work, uh, it seemed, you, you put on the definition of the architecture museum. So uh, you, you spent your first slides uh, describing what you do, design in public uh, sphere. Uh, I overheard you saying, uh, perhaps moving away from architecture and design, and don't know if I interpreted it correctly, but. I'm not moving away from it. No. <laughs> but, uh, Maybe you think about the history that we're not so focused on that. But sorry, oh, we can sorry. move on. Sorry. Continue. I'm sorry. And so um, I really think this shows that it, museums already are a place where uh, there is a critical thinking on uh, what architecture is, uh, what, it, what its uh, breadth is. Uh, how many fields it covers. And so I think that's, I don't know, that's good. That's 
Yeah, it could Positive. be. Positive. I've never really thought about it like that. I think one of the things, I don't know, from my point of view, I think the reason that we all have to talk all the time about what our institutions are is that it's not so obvious that there should be a Swedish Museum of Architecture and Design as there should be a National Museum. Like, we have to make the case a lot more than yeah. the Victoria and Albert Museum. Yeah. Who knows what the Victoria and Albert Museum is? Is it like the Queen's old clothes? You know, people have no idea, but they know that it should be. Yeah. But our institutions have to fight a bit harder sometimes. So maybe we've done a bit more work in that regard. Yeah, and as uh, perha perhaps you said, uh, an art museum is an easier object to identify. So uh, the term architecture itself seemed to be a bit uh, frightening, I don't know, uh, made only for a certain kind of public. Uh, so I guess that re rediscussing what that term means is crucial for, mm. for this. Uh, yeah. But I think it is a good point in the sense that that if we are not, I mean, I could just, we, we're all a member of ICAM, yeah, so, so we, we have quite a knowledge you know, about how is it actually going. I think generally you would say that the architecture museums, centers in Europe are probably not getting more subsidies generally over the last 10 years. They're actually being challenged. I think generally here, maybe not, but, no. but I think that would be the, the average in relation to the importance of architecture and urban development and densification and so forth. So, so there is something about you know, making the case, as you say, for why are we here? What value do we create in society? Maybe it's something that would be, uh, I forgot to mention, but a couple of years ago I did a survey about architectural museums. In, yes. uh, there was um, altogether around 30 architectural museums in the world, and 29 are in Europe. So it's very European uh, well, phenomenon. I mean, it's, uh, the value, we speak about values, so it's, it's uh, something, this uh, historical legacy, which is valued uh, in that way, uh, in museum format, in, in Europe more. Maybe uh, Le Corbusier Museum hopefully will be the 30, uh, 31st one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, the Canadian, Canadian one is the only one in, in States. No, no, but it's very interesting because if you look a little bit uh, at the history of architectural music, we are speaking now of uh, uh, institutions mm -hmm. like uh, tools. So uh, if you look at the history of this architecture museum, apart of the Moscow, speaking of uh, the modern example, not going to Son and so on, uh, Moscow and then Helsinki, I think it was the second one, mm -hmm. the exactly. 50s, Moscow's yeah. in the end of the 20s. Mm, the big uh, development architecture museum was mainly in, uh, in the 70s and the yeah. 80s, started there. It was not only in Europe, it was a lot in North America, even if that took a totally different uh, character, and was really related to uh, a kind of historical shift, a kind of a postmodern shift. And uh, uh, it was mentioned before, the, the idea of architecture as a cultural mm. product. And uh, some people, mentioning, for example, Ole Bauman, they make, uh, that was uh, the director of the NIE in the Netherlands, uh, starting for 10 years after the 2000, is uh, underlying the fact that, especially for the Netherlands, this uh, shift uh, was crucial because it was corresponding to a, how can I say, mm, architecture, urban planning, urbanism, or planners, architects, and that, not anymore be, being part of the big decision. Architecture not being anymore part of the strategy, uh, political decision about the real transformation of the territory, of the cities, of the land. And uh, he look at that, uh, so it was underlying a kind of the dark side of this shift from an effective capacity of architecture to operate to the idea of the emerging of these institutions that were dealing with architecture as a culture product. In reality, 
Uh, I don't know if I would uh, mark uh, this in, in that way. I would like uh, to mark that also in a certain way. I think that uh, the, the end uh, of dismantling of the welfare state of oh, sorry, of welfare the dismantling state. of the welfare state, state yeah. was really the critical point. The cri after the crisis of 2008, uh, in 2012, uh, there was a small exhibition by one of the most uh, relevant, still famous uh, star uh, architect, uh, Ram Collas, together with uh, Oma and Emo, in uh, in. Uh, uh, Biennale in Venice, it was a small exhibition. And I think that that is the, how very smart from a person like Ram to acknowledge, how can I say, the end of this kind of star system mediatization of architecture period. He did a small exhibition on public works, architecture by civil servants. Yeah. And uh, in a certain way, it was, uh, I c we could read, uh, of course, that as uh, the end of this kind of uh, um, 40 years of a neoliberal process of dismantling the welfare state, and, uh, and again, uh, dismantling also the idea of the architect uh, as a star, dismantling the idea of architecture as a media, so dismantling, making this proposal to have institution dealing with architecture and multimedia and these look very, very old because they belong to the past and not to the present. And rediscovering the effective role of architecture in building a new city a new environment, a new condition, physical condition for our life. In a certain way, rediscovering a role that in part modern architecture had, because when uh, uh, was uh, uh, part of the effort to build a better condition for, in the first part of the 20th century, better condition for the new social workers, uh, social class that was emerging, offering services, offering leisure space, uh, offering this kind of qualities. Uh, that in a certain way, we could consider that uh, the real monument uh, of modern architecture, a monument uh, related to the building of a social uh, democratic uh, society in the, in the first part of the, of the 20th century. So in a certain way, there is this kind of uh, uh, situation, I feel, for which uh, uh, all these kind of uh, values, interests, possibilities, how architecture could be effective. I think that uh, this is the moment in which, uh, really, we, we can look at the history also of architecture institution in a different way. They could become, again, a critical space to develop a more effective policy, a real intervention, a real, uh, uh, can you are directly related because you are part of the developing pol of the policy strategies of uh, some of ministry. Uh, yeah, but, but it's, it's interesting what you're saying. I'm listening carefully here because I think it's, a, it's quite an interesting story that you are winding up and it's, I totally agree with it, but, uh, even though that I am now on the expert panel of creating a new national architecture policy, I have no interference from the state in what we do at DAC. They only come with 15%, so I say it's fair. They shouldn't <laughs> decide that much. But, but the point is actually more that um, that idea that you are making evident, which was really the case, I think, for many of the Scandinavian, kind of, several of the Scandinavian countries, one of the big uh, entrepreneurs, architects in Denmark who did thousands of housing is famous for saying, you are not in the business of doing architecture to earn money. You are in the business of architecture to deliver good solutions for the people. And that was an, uh, a, a contractor. So the point is that 
that time is over, I agree with you. But I think, I think, I'm not quite sure how it is in Sweden, actually. But Norway and Denmark, we would insist that we can have both. <laughs> so we can both have that kind of you know, wild capitalism on the one hand uh, and, um, and private architects. And we can't have them to sit inside the state and design reality. No, but uh, you mentioned in your text before, I think I, perhaps I'm not wrong, uh, the um, public-private uh, 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 partnership. partnership. Yeah. I feel that, for example, it's very interesting to change these uh, public-private partnership uh, in uh, a little bit a slightly different way after the experience that we had in all this period, at yeah. least in some countries, uh, which means a partnership uh, for uh, public purpose. It's not my, yeah. my slogan. No, but that's but, what it is. But, uh, but uh, is uh, underlying a totally different uh, game going on in this kind of uh, relationship. So. I think that I see people looking at the clock. We are 20 <laughs> minutes late. So um, we can take uh, perhaps um, one or two questions, if you have. Everything is clear. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you all very much. It was very interesting, very interesting contrast with this morning, um, but it just puts me in mind of the fact that we're, as architectural museums, we're really a subsection of museums. And when I think of the three great institutions that were created in the 19th century, the public library, the public museum, and the department store, I think the only one really that survives in a way that's recognizably, would be recognizable to our 19th century ancestors uh, is the museum. You think so? I think yeah. so. I yes, think I think so. I More so than a library. You go to a library today, you don't see any books. No, I agree. <laughs> no. Or indeed, um, well, yes, I, th I think the, um, and the, shopping the department store, store has, you know, in a way broken down into concessions. You know, they're very few. So I, th I think there is a resilience about the museum which uh, yeah. should encourage us. Although there are museums which are only filled with screens, so it's also <laughs> no, not I mean, I think What you're saying is that we're all, we have different, we operate in different uh, economic and social conditions mm. uh, and yeah. different mo uh, agendas. I think that's really true. I think we should be extremely confident about the future of museums for precisely that reason. Like, museums are a success story, especially of the last 20 years of Ryanair tourism. Like, London has gone from a modestly interesting city to the world's biggest tourist city, partly fueled or mainly fueled by massive investment in cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. And you know, we always talk in Stockholm, the museums are the hidden motor of the economy of Stockholm, really, especially the visitor economy, which is a bigger and bigger part. So I think we should be really, you know, we, I, I started at the VNA. What year was that then? 2012. And they said in 2000 they would have 1 million visitors. In 2012 they had 3.7 million visitors. That's unbelievable growth by any standards, and any department store would be happy about that, and anybody. <laughs> so, so I think museums are a success story, there's absolutely no doubt. And, and you know, the fact that museums, especially in places like London, have responded to that success by building great public spaces, not more galleries and not more, not, you know, I mean, your own institution is a great example of that, loosening up the circulation so more people, I mean, London is a great example of, of you know, the new V&A courtyard, the British Council, court, the British Museum courtyard, the Tate Modern's Turbine Hall, spectacular, yes, monumental, you probably wouldn't do it like that today, but they are not spaces for objects, they're spaces for people, and large numbers of them, I think that's inspiring, we should just continue down that road, I don't see any problem with that, really, um, because the kinds of, uh, the kinds of, to come back to the, the previous discussion. Museums are a unique kind of regime of attention. They're a unique kind of exa experience as a citizen that is unavailable anywhere else. And we should be so, people should be giving us loads more money to create more of that kind of space, I believe. And it's a bit banal observation perhaps, but I share your, uh, your But one thing I would like to challenge though, because that, that, that's kind of somehow what on the one hand we want to see, uh, but the more you cater for the rich tourists, or the tourists, um, 
the more you also have a price level that makes it much more difficult to do what we are trying to do. I disagree with that, Ken. I, no. I think, look, look at Tate Modern. It went from zero visitors in 1999 to nine and a half million visitors a year this year. That, there's no question that some of those nine and a half million people are British people who have never been to a museum before. There's just no question about that. It would be that. interesting to see the, it absolutely figures. is. I know it is. And, yeah. and who would wish Tate Modern not to exist for all of its influence on education, yeah. on the many, many national programs it does? It leverages tourism for that purpose, yeah. and so does the V&A. Okay, my, my point is just that I think it's important that the, uh, when, when Mirko was talking about being a tool, that that, that role in society, that, they, that institutions like ours or museums can still have that role. Mm. Because they could also just kind of disappear into a a huge cultural commercialism. They yep. could, but I think that's, yep. yeah. They, they could disappear in that direction, but I don't see much evidence of at least large museums ending up there. Of course, David Bowie happens at the V&A, but the V&A still employs a thousand people mm -hmm. who are doing very, very different um, things. It's, we're, more, we're smaller institutions, we're much more vulnerable maybe. And you know, before I arrived, my own institution was doing Jean-Paul Gaultier exhibitions for no real reason other than to try to sell some tickets. Um, we don't do that anymore because we're trying to forge a clearer identity. But, uh, but I don't see evidence that that problem you're describing is a... No. OK, we take the last question. No, I'm sorry. Uh, but at the same time, I know for sure that uh, in uh, Ile-de-France, I mean, not Paris, but the Parisian region, there is, you know, Hundred, I don't know the names, the numbers. Hundred of museums. It, in fact, very few are visited. Very few of them. You know, the Louvre is visited, Orsay is visited, and of course uh, some of them. But most of them are not visited enough. It means that they are cost, uh, not cost effective. You know, no. kind of. So it's not because you have, you have so many museums that mean that you know the level of education or, or the, I don't know, the awareness of arts or architecture. For example, the Cité de l'Architecture, who obviously is not represented here, has a, a very low level of visitors. It's less than 300,000. When you compare it to the Eiffel Tower just in front of it, which, has, which had before uh, kind of 3 million or 4 million, you know, it's, you wonder why all those people are not going to see architecture. It's not, you know, it's a question. It's an open question. I don't have the so answer. So it's also the question of how does that ecosystem continue um, instead of the big institutions um, burning out or drying out um, uh, those more, yeah. That happened in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Bilbao uh, the first five, seven years. It happened instantly, and then they realized they had to do something because the, the smaller museums and cities around just uh, died in almost within two years, three years, and now they, they made a, a, a conscious strategy for that. But that's another, yeah. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So, okay, so being the last uh, uh, panel, we take the advantage of being the last. I'm used to be the last for alphabetical reasons, so I've been asked. <laughs> because I have a training being the last to thank all of you, to thank the panel of this afternoon and also the intervention of this morning, to thank our host and uh, yes. Guido and um, all the team and uh, all the official representation of the institution, uh, that uh, it was a very nice opportunity also, I think, uh, for us, for sure, uh, to listen and this afternoon to discuss, I hope also for you. As you see, we have no solution, but uh, following uh, the, the, the hour, uh, what we said, uh, we are here to have uh, an interesting conversation and open to the different opinions, uh, trying to get uh, more public uh, for the future. And using also the online presence and not only the physical one. One trying to put in, in place some of the suggestions coming out from the discussion of today. Good. For sure, I, next year I hope there will be a conversation uh, in a less dark uh, 
scenario, but uh, that is always a hope uh, that as architects or people dealing with architecture, we always think of the future in a more positive way. Thank you very much to all of you and to our <laughs>